Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Green Mountain Care Board meeting. I'm going to call the meeting to order. Today um, is part of an ongoing discussion on um, where we are in Vermont and how we uh, cre create sustainability for our system over the long term. And um, with that in mind, we're going to hear from two contractors today. And um, one of the things that uh, is abundantly clear if you look at today's hospitalization numbers is that our hospitals are strained. That uh, what many people believed may have been excess of capacity um, before the pandemic um, certainly is needed on days like today. And that um, as we move forward with our discussions that we're, are going to take many years to complete, we're going to um, need to, to base decisions based on data. And that's really what today is about, um, getting some of the data that looks at a point in time. And um, we readily acknowledge that point in time um, is a couple years ago. Um, but in many respects, um, we could not have used 2020 because of uh, the uh, shutdown in 21 um, may not be a great uh, base year either, but this creates data that will help us in, in what needs to be an ongoing discussion by Vermonters about how we uh, have a healthcare system that we can afford, that Vermonters can have access to, and get quality care in a timely manner. So it's one more piece of information in our discussions about making sure that Vermonters have the right care at the right time, in the right setting, and at the right price. And the board uh, readily uh, acknowledges that, um, unlike other industries, that just in time isn't what you're striving for. You have to be prepared for that bus crash or plane crash, or you have to be prepared for a pandemic. And the board um, understands that. And this is not to try to um, force issues down people's throat, but it's the, the, the start of a discussion that needs to occur. And uh, it's something that I'm very pleased to start seeing um, some of the data points coming back together. So before I turn it over to Elena to tee up the discussion this morning, I'm going to turn to Susan Barrett for the executive director's report. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have a few announcements. First, the November board schedule will be posted on our website later this week, so I'd encourage folks to take a look at that. The very busy month coming up next week, next month, and there are several meetings that are not on Wednesdays, but on other days of the week. Uh, we have several ongoing and open special public comment periods. I will list them quickly here. First, the board is accepting public comment on the draft healthcare workforce strategic plan that was submitted by the director of healthcare reform to the board on October 15th. Uh, we are accepting that public comment until November 1st of 2021. The board must review and approve the draft plan within 30 days upon receipt. So we encourage anyone who is uh, wanting to comment on that plan to please submit those comments by November 1st. They will be posted on our website. The second is that the board received One Care Vermont ACO's FY22 budget on October 1st and the 2022 certification form on August, 30th, August 30th. Submission materials can be found on our website under ACO Oversight and under the public comment section of our website. One Care will present, One Care is the only um, ACO present uh, uh, in, the, in the state right now that has um, full budget review by the Green Mountain Care Board. Uh, One Care will present their budget at a public meeting on November 10th and the board staff will present their analysis on December 8th. So we want to make sure, again, you submit your public comment by December 1st so that the board can take and the staff can take those comments into consideration. 
And last, as I've stated several times throughout uh, our board meetings over the last um, year, we are currently and an ongoing accepting public comments on a potential next agreement with the federal government for an all-peer model. We will be sharing all of those comments with our uh, colleagues at the Agency of Human Services and the Governor's Office as they are leading that negotiation. And last but certainly not least, um, this evening at 5.30 p.m. via Teams, a state panel investigating wait times in the state will conduct a listening session. The panel is looking to hear firsthand experiences of patients and caregivers who are experiencing excessive wait times while seeking health services in Vermont. That information to get onto that uh, listening session is also located on our website and on the um, Department of Financial Regulation website. So with that, I will turn it back to you, Chair Mullen, unless there are any questions. I'm not hearing any, Susan. So the next item on the agenda are the minutes of Wednesday, October 20th. Is there a motion? So moved. Move. Second. Thank you. <laughs> moved by Tom, seconded by Jess. The motion is to approve the minutes of Wednesday, October 20th without any additions, deletions, or corrections. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed signify by saying nay. Let the record show the motion carried unanimously. So at this point in time, I'm going to um, turn the meeting over to Elena Barraby, who will introduce uh, Mark Pedrazic. And um, this is the beginning of the um, hospital payment and cost coverage variation discussion. And Elena, I'll turn it over to you. Great, thank you, Chair Mullen. So I'm going to share my screen. Please let me know when you can see it. We see a black screen. Wonderful. Yes. Here we go. Now we're okay. off. <laughs> All right. So, okay. So, um, you know, here we're talking about hospital sustainability and healthcare affordability. Um, so this is really, these analyses are to inform the Act 159 of 2020 Section 4 report on improving hospital sustainability. Um, we felt that it was important to include reference to affordability given the tension between these two that we don't, that we have to pursue multiple objectives. So we'll talk about that a little bit today, but I'm just giving a, a brief reminder um, about, you know, what led up to this work and, and why we're hearing what we're hearing. But first I wanted to kind of um, recognize the the approach to that this work has really required all hands on deck from the board's perspective. So while I may be doing this overview, um, you know, Patrick Rooney and the finance team, Sarah Kinsler and the policy team, Sarah Lindbergh, huge role on the analytics team in, in helping put this work forward, not to mention um, hospitals and other stakeholders that have given us feedback along the way um, that we're really thankful for that and hope that you know we can continue to solicit your feedback as we complete this report. Um, so as I mentioned, I'll do a quick reminder, then we'll hear from HMA um, Burns and Associates. Um, Sarah Lindbergh, time permitting, will review some supplementary analysis. And then this afternoon, we'll hear from Berkeley Research Group on um, quality and capacity planning. Um, so, you know, why are we here? Rural hospital closures are increasing across the U.S. This is a statistic that keeps growing, um, unfortunately, and with 2020 representing the highest rate of closures um, of rural hospitals across the U.S. Um, in a recent study um, done in Health Affairs published in 2020, uh, the study found over the period that the median overall profit margin of hospitals prior to closure was negative 3.2 percent, um, not a margin that we are unfamiliar with. Um, and this is important because hospital closures threaten not only patient access to essential services, but have material impact on the local economy, um, as highlighted um, in the Rural Health Services Task Force um, work. So, you know, this is really alarming given um, one of our own recent hospital bankruptcies and, and 
and other statistics that we've continued to witness, um, namely the hospital mar our own hospital margins, which have been on the decline for the last five years. Um, as you can see in 2020, they're still hovering still around zero. zero. Um, there's a little echo of someone echo. mute. Um, so, you know, this is, while it looks like we're back on the incline, this is not, this may be misleading. This includes COVID relief funds, which are not expected to continue in the future and are really not a sustainable means of keeping our system afloat. Um, you know, the reason that we continue to see these declining margins is, is one that, you know, we continue to talk about, which is the expenses are outpacing revenue growth. Um, across our rural hospitals, main drivers being the cost of labor and benefits. This includes travelers, the cost of supplies, including pharmaceuticals, um, and again, our aging population and increasing needs of our communities. Um, and so, you know, as I mentioned, this, this COVID relief fund and other operating revenue continue to be in, um, a larger proportion of the way um, that we kind of keep our, our system afloat. Um, so this needs careful attention if we want to make sure that we prevent any further hospital bankruptcies and potential closures. Um, I think it's important to recognize that this, this issue around hospital solvency is really tightly connected with um, Vermonters healthcare affordability, namely in the, in the commercial sector, but everywhere. And um, you know, so while hospitals are struggling to maintain their health on one hand, um, we can't continue to plug hospital solvency concerns with commercial charges. Um, and that is kind of the un unfortunate um, structure that, that hospitals are currently living within. Um, I don't, I, I want to mention this because I don't think it's, you know, we're not trying to point fingers and hospitals are responsible for driving all of this, but I think it's, you know, the, the system within which we live, which is still largely fee for service, um, makes this a, a, a real challenge. Um, and this this is a problem because it has a direct effect on the premiums and cost sharing and other expenses felt by Vermonters and Vermont employers, um, and why you know we have um, such um, such an affordability crisis. So really finding a solution um, to hospital um, sustainability needs to incorporate um, affordability at its center. Um, and this is kind of just reiterating that point that we've seen increasing hospital commercial charges over the years. Um, and that this is a, a necessary component to solving this issue. Um, you know, so according to the 2018 Vermont Household Health Insurance Survey, more than a quarter um, of those who were uninsured um, worked for an employer who offered health insurance and 73% of those cited that cost was the only or primary reason they do not have insurance. Uh, more than a third of Vermonters under the age of 65 who are underinsured um, and then um, among those who had private insurance, 40% con are considered under underinsured in 2018 as compared to 27% in 2014. So this is a pretty substantial increase and suggests that, that the issue is only getting worse. Um, and this is also important because underinsured and uninsured Vermonters are more likely to delay care um, than those with um, better insurance. And you know, this is only going to create more chronic um, and complex needs for patients that, if dealt with down the line, are, are going to be not only more expensive, but is, will render worse outcomes um, for Vermonters. So identifying potential solutions, you know, just as a reminder, this work started a number of years ago with the board requiring sustainability plans for six of the 14 hospitals. With COVID, um, you expanded this to all hospitals. And then the legislature codified their interest um, and urgency of this matter in their report in 2020 um, around hospital sustainability, increasing population health and access to essential services. Um, since then, we've kind of included equity and affordability as key criteria um, in thinking about solutions um, going forward. Um, so this is another slide pulled that should be familiar. Um, hospital financial solvency is really about ensuring that hospital revenues are sufficient to cover the costs of operating a system that strikes a balance between efficiency and access in rural Vermont. So we want to make sure that equitable that there's reimbursement that provides equitable access to essential services in all Vermont communities, um, that there's efficient economic delivery of services, and that these are done in an affordable way for Vermonters, and, and that the um, kind of end result is that we have improved health outcomes for Vermonters. So it should not be a system that continues to drive, to be focused on sick care, that we really need to get the right services at the right time, the right place for the right price, as you mentioned um, before, Chair Mullen. 
So the project approach, um, current state and gap analysis, this is kind of where we are today and what you'll hear about. So I uh, mentioned a little bit on financial health. The, um, our hospital team led by Patrick Rooney is continuing to flesh out some key metrics associated um, with hospital financial health that we found in the literature. Um, today we'll hear from HMA Burns and Associates on provider reimbursement variation cost coverage and then later from Berkeley Research Group on community access to essential services um, and looking at capacity and quality. Um, we've, you know, loved the engagement that we've had from the hospitals where we can get it given their um, severe, you know, constraints around COVID and hope that, you know, we can continue to collaborate and think about um, creative solutions to these issues. Um, and then part three will be synthesizing these insights that you will hear today and, and you know, where we can go next, what are some potential paths forward um, to improve hospital sustainability, equitable access to essential affordable services and preparedness for valuable uh, value-based care. Um, so I just want to reiterate um, some points. Um, you know, we recognize that we're still in a pandemic um, and we're currently experiencing a surge in the capacity across all Vermont hospitals right now. And um, you know, this work that began in 2020 does use pre-pandemic data and is designed to help inform communities, their providers, and the state as we engage in post-pandemic long-term planning, uh, planning. So this is not, um, you know, something that we expect to, to fix tomorrow, and this is really going to take um, careful, intentional thought and conversation um, across all of our stakeholders. Um, but this could also lead to regulatory improvements and insights that could be used in our federal um, potential next federal agreement. Um, and we want to, you know, emphasize that we appreciate all of the work um, that our, our frontline workers and hospitals and healthcare workers have committed over this past um, year and a half and likely into the future. So um, I'll stop there, but I, I'm, you know, eager to, to hear these insights and I'll turn it over now to Mark um, and um, look forward to the continued conversation. Thank you, Elena. I'm going to share my screen. If someone could acknowledge. We see they... it, Mark. Thank you. Great. Perfect. Um, so uh, just to set the stage here, I, I want to be respectful of everyone's time. I understand that um, I'm allotted until 1230, uh, so about 75 minutes. I have about 35 slides. I am going to start with the key findings right up front and then walk you through the levels of detail and granularity as we go. Um, Quick introductions. I'm Mark Podrazic uh, with uh, Health Management Associates. We're uh, part of the Burns and Associates division. The odd nomenclature is because I used to be the president of Burns and Associates and we were acquired by HMA in September of 2020. Um, Peter Burns and I, he's the Burns of Burns and Associates. He's now retired, but uh, we founded Burns and Associates back in 2006. Uh, my Brief background, I've been working with state Medicaid agencies primarily for the last 25 years on a variety of uh, issues, uh, specifically on reimbursement and more specifically hospital reimbursement, uh, set rates for inpatient and outpatient services for five different state Medicaid agencies and work with some others on some background analytic assessment reports. Uh, probably most important to all of yours information is that um, one of our first jobs at Burns and Associates was to assist Vermont's Medicaid program move to uh, a DRG payment system in a uh, mirror of the Medicare outpatient payment system way back in 2006. And I appreciate um, actually our continued relationship uh, with all the hospitals in Vermont throughout all these years. It's been uh, very thoughtful and respectful and um, good insights from the hospitals uh, on all prior projects, including this one. So I have eight key findings. Um, and uh, again, we'll, we'll, I'll go into the details about the data we've used and some uh, important notes, but just to hit the headlines here, um, within the data that we looked at, which was three years of data, the hospital's fiscal years ending in September 30, 2017, 2018, and 2019, we found that hospitals were paid between 87 and 95 percent of their costs for the inpatient services that were in our study, 
and between 112 and 117 percent of their costs for the outpatient services in our study. Those uh, payment to cost ratios are also called cost coverage ratios is all payers combined. Um, the overall ratio when we combine the inpatient and outpatient utilization together for the information in our study that is was 101.9 percent for the year ending in 2017 100.8% in 2018 and 97.5% in 2019. So this dovetails with the slide that Elena showed on the erosion of the cost coverage. I do want to point out, I'll dwell on a little bit later in the presentation, this 97.5% in 2019, um, I would consider that the lower bound because we do believe there might be some incomplete payments from CMS for the Medicare ACO members in the all payer claims database. That was our source of data. We're not concerned about the Medicaid ACO experience, but a little bit on the Medicare. So this could be a little bit higher than 97.5. However, the overall trend you can see is very close to break even and a slight erosion over the years. Importantly, uh, finding three is the cost shift continues and the cost shift is wide. These percentages show the percentage of costs covered by major payer, Medicaid, Medicare, and commercial for the three years ending in 17, 18, and 19, inpatient and outpatient separately. So you can see Medicaid has been low but steady, about 73 to 76% of the costs covered overall. Medicare, you can see 95% for inpatient in 17, then 89% in 2018, and there's that 82%. So that's the one we think might be a little low here, but you can see it was never 100% even in the other two years. And then outpatient is also quite low. In fact, the Medicare cost coverage is similar to Medicaid. And then commercial, you can see it's more than 100% more than of the cost covered, but there is quite a disparity between outpatient services and inpatient services, i.e. the 256% is basically saying that the hospitals are reimbursed two and a half times their cost for the outpatient services in our study. It did go down to just about two times cost, but nonetheless, it's quite different than the inpatient side for the commercial payers, which hover close to, closer to 100% of costs. When we look at this data, the root cause of this change in the cost coverage, yes, costs are increasing, absolutely, for all hospitals, but the variation itself really is um, indicative of the rate of payment as opposed to the rate of cost. So in other words, yes, the costs are increasing, but the delta between the payment across the payers is really what is driving this change and I have some uh, charts to show you to illustrate that. Last few findings. Um, in addition to the wide variation across the major payers, there is also wide variation in the percent of costs covered for each of the hospitals in Vermont. And furthermore, there's wide variation in the percent of costs covered for specific services under inpatient and outpatient uh, delivery systems, and I have some charts to show you some examples of that as well. Another item is that we do not see any direct correlation between the charges that hospitals are charging versus their net payments or their cost coverage. So even if a charge master for a hospital has grown, say, 5% year over year, that doesn't mean that their cost coverage increased 5%. In fact, it could just as easily have decreased because embedded under the charge master are all the contractual agreements with, with the payers, particularly the commercial payers. It's important to note, and I will dwell on this a little bit further, that the findings presented today do not comprise the entire hospital budget. So even though I just showed you some cost coverage uh, values, that is not necessarily every hospital's specific cost coverage for the year. Why? Because we used Vermont's all-payer claims database as our source and not all the hospital's data. 
utilization for those three years we looked at is in the database. Um, specifically, the hospitals, the, the services that are included in the database are delivered to Vermont residents only. So we have included Dartmouth in this analysis at the board's request, um, but keep in mind that that's going to be the utilization from Dartmouth for Vermonters, not the preponderance of their book of business. So, i.e., keep in mind that it could be that higher acuity services are represented in the Dartmouth numbers because Vermonters are going to Dartmouth because of more higher acuity services as opposed to, say, deliveries or, or well babies or simple um, outpatient services. Likewise, UVMC is going to have some New York experience as well, and that's not in their numbers. There's also obviously other hospitals on the border that this impacts as well. Um, the services that we're including are those that are covered under Medicare's MSDRG system, which is the, the, the method of payment that Medicare uses, um, as well as its outpatient prospective payment system, also called the OPPS. Um, also about half of the self-funded utilization is not in the database. So that's a, a, you know, a large component that we're missing. I do want to point out whenever we talk about the cost coverage or the payment to cost ratios, hospitals are billing a technical side, which is the cost borne by the hospital itself, separate from the physicians that are delivering the service. So if there is a surgery, the hospital is going to be billing on the technical side, the technical piece for the, the surgery room and all the, the supplies, et cetera, related to the surgery. The surgeon bills separately for her or his time. That professional component is not in this study just the technical side. Also, there are payments to hospitals outside of claims, but because we're using a claims database, not an all payments database, the most obvious example is disproportionate share payments that are paid by DIVA, Vermont Medicaid. Those payments are not included in this analysis. Furthermore, there's also a hospital provider tax uh, that hospitals are paying to the state. And that is also outside of claims, so that is also not factored into this analysis. Let me pause there to make sure I invite board members to ask questions along the way. I know we want to get through everything, but because this is the key findings, I'll stop here before I get into details. Um, if anybody has any questions or comments thus far. So board members have been trying to uh, wait to the end of the presentation to ask questions. So Mark, you're uh, you're giving us a, a good opportunity to ask questions along the way. Do any board members have any questions at, at this point in time? Okay. I'm not hearing you, Mark, so why don't you just I'll, keep going? I'll, and I'll dig right in then. Um, I introduced myself. You can read that at your leisure. Um, okay, some background. So our key objectives in this study was to assess the variation in the rate of payment for inpatient outpatient hospital services across the major payers, as you saw. Also to examine the payment variation across hospitals and major service categories under the hood of inpatient and outpatient. To look at the percent of hospital costs covered by major payer and by individual hospitals and major service categories. And then also, uh, importantly, <laughs> to assess the reliability of the data sources that we're using uh, in the event that the board is interested in further exploration, we want to understand how reliable our data source is before you know, determining that this is the, the baseline, if you will, of the study. I'm not going to read you everything here, but kind of quickly go over some of the terminology that I use throughout the presentation. So an inpatient discharge represents all the services on the technical side that a, a patient would be receiving while they're staying in the hospital from admission to discharge. Outpatient service, I do want to dwell on that a bit because outpatient services, the way that they're billed is that multiple services in an outpatient setting can be billed on a single claim by a hospital. 
the Medicare OPPS payment system and DIVA's OPPS payment system um, effectively unbundles the services on that claim such that, let's say an example that there's 10 lines on a claim that's billed, but on those 10 lines, two of them are significant procedures. It could be an ED visit and say then ultimately result in an outpatient surgery. And the other eight lines are more smaller cost ancillary services. So those 10 lines get broken up into two services, which you know the terminology CMS uses is called pseudo claims because they're not the actual first claim, it's, it's a pretend claim. And then we roll the ancillary services under those two significant procedures. So what was one claim becomes two claims, but all the ancillary costs are embedded in the significant procedure. And that's what we did here in this analysis as well. Charges, I think everyone knows, but that's the amount that's billed by the hospital. The payments amounts that we're using when we look at payment to cost ratios includes the amount from the payer, the co-pays, and the deductibles. Importantly in Vermont for the ACO assigned services, we have what we often call the would have paid amount. In other words, if the claim was paid under a fee for service arrangement that is captured. It is reported in the database, all payer claims database. However, as I pointed out, we believe the 2019 numbers for Medicare only are on the low side. I'm going to talk you through how we determine the costs. And then I've already introduced the payment to cost ratio. It's also called cost coverage. So that represents what percentage of, of the hospital's costs on the claims we looked at are covered by payments uh, in the system. Prospective payment system hospitals or PPS hospitals as they're called are those that are paid under Medicare's prospective payment system. That's going to be um, UVMC and Dartmouth and some of the, the larger acute care hospitals in the state. The critical access hospitals um, are the smaller hospitals. They have a special designation by CMS and the reason why we're uh, highlighting this here is because critical access hospitals ultimately are paid 99% of their costs. They're paid something up front and then there's a settlement process later. Um, the settlement process can often be very lengthy in time for the, the final payment to be received by the hospital for the time period of study. For our purposes today, when we look at payment to cost ratios for Medicare only, and for critical access hospitals only, we have forced it to be 99% because that is ultimately what will be paid to those hospitals. That's not to say that that's true though for Medicaid or commercial payers. Um, as I mentioned, we use the VCURES database as the abbreviation is called. Um, we're using the hospital fiscal year data for three years. Inpatient and outpatient claims, claim status of paid. We also used information from each hospital's uh, CMS hospital cost report. It's often called the Medicare cost report, but it actually includes data for all payers and all costs. Um, there's a standardized series of reports that each hospital's responsible to submit, and we use selected uh, schedules from the cost reports for the same three time periods that we use for the claims. So we identified the, the services for inpatient and outpatient hospital. Um, we use the hospital's federal tax ID in the database to make sure we captured because sometimes there's multiple IDs for hospitals. We broke up the payers into these six groupings. You can see DIVA, Medicare fee for service, Medicare Advantage, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont, MVP and all others combined. In today's presentation, we've put all the commercial together as one group, and we've actually excluded Medicare Advantage, although yes, it is growing a bit, but still it's it's quite low vis-a-vis -vis fee-for-service Medicare, so we've excluded it from the analysis. We created uh, inpatient hospital service categories and outpatient hospital service categories for the purposes of compared, comparing the payment variation and the cost variation, and here they are. Um, the inpatient, without reading them all, is effectively based on diagnostic categories. You can see respiratory versus circulatory, et cetera. 
They're diagnosis related groups or DRGs. There's about 750 of those categories. Each of those uniquely maps to one of these categories here. On the outpatient side, you can see there, we looked at the volume and the commonality of procedures of which there are thousands of procedures. And each of those is uniquely mapped to one of these categories as well. On the data set preparation, um, we did look at trends on volume by payer for each hospital across each year. We validated the payment amounts. We looked at the one care utilization specifically for that would have paid. That's where we determined we are light on 2019 for inpatient one care, Medicare in particular. Um, we ran our costing logic assigning costs to the services, which I'll go over next, and then compared those results over the three years. And then we looked at the payment to cost ratios by hospital, by year, and by payer. Um, because we're doing a relatively sophisticated process to assign the costs using inputs from the cost reports, as I mentioned, we also looked at the inputs that were used to in the cost computation to make sure there was consistency, for example, on the room and board costs uh, by the reported by the hospital each year. And there's a differentiation, say, between a semi-private regular room versus an ICU bed versus a nursery bed. Um, for ancillary services, hospitals are required to report the payments and the costs by service, whether it be laboratory, radiology, drugs, um, the ED. We looked at the ratios, I'm sorry, um, the cost and the charges. We looked at the cost to charge ratio, which is reported on the cost report at each department level for each hospital for each year to look for consistency there because we're using that when we assign costs. This gets a little complicated, but let me give you an example of how we assign the costs. So there's a worksheet on the cost report called D1. That's where these room and board costs and they're expressed as a per diem. And so you can see this is a this is not any particular hospital. This is uh, illustrative data. You can see, for example, in this case, the regular semi-private room is $1,420 a day versus the nursery is only $455 a day, as opposed to the ICU, which is almost twice as much as the regular room. And that's pretty common. We see that. And then here's these ratios, and you can see some examples of the different categories that are reported on the cost report and the ratio. So why is this important? When the claim comes in, the hospitals are reporting on a each revenue code, so like for example, 120 is the code for the routine room, which is this 1420. And let's say the case came in and had three days. So at the bottom here, we're gonna multiply three days times this 1420 to get the 4260. And let's say one of the days of this day was in the ICU. So then the one day is multiplied by the 2936. Likewise, the ancillary services, we take the charges and we multiply by this ratio because this is the cost to charge ratio. So then we can take the charges and multiply by that ratio to get the costs. So I'm showing different examples of charges times the ratios in the blue box to get the cost. And then we add all the lines together to get the total cost for that case. In this case, an inpatient discharge. That's done for every single line on every single claim, inpatient and outpatient, and we're using the values from the cost report for the year to map back to our study year. So if it was a case with a claim that ended sometime in the October 1, 2016 to September 30, 2017 time period, we're using the values in the green and the blue boxes from that hospital's cost report for that year. So it's all this information that's our source is hospital specific and it's year specific. Another uh, nuance to our analysis is that 
it's probably pretty obvious to anyone that the costs are going to vary by hospital for various reasons. But one of the most important reasons is because some hospitals are delivering much higher acuity services than their peers. And so there is a way that has been established to effectively put hospitals on an apples to apples comparison when we're looking at costs. And the term of art is used is applying a case mix adjustment. So, you know, I'm sure it would be obvious that UVMC is gonna have much higher acuity cases on average than one of the critical access hospitals in the state. So we tend to report the information on average payment per case or average cost per case without applying this case mix adjustment and then with applying this case mix adjustment so that um, stakeholders can see what is the true variation because of acuity if among other reasons. And then after we kind of control for the acuity, is there still variation? And you'll see our results in a moment in both methods. But here's an example of why this is important. So let's say there's two hospitals and we, saw, we determined that the average payment for this inpatient stay was $10,000 for both hospitals. The cost for hospital A was 11,000 and for hospital B it was 9,800. The acuity or the case mix score is important. If a hospital has a case mix score greater than 1.0, that means that that hospital has a higher acuity than the average of their peers that we're looking at. In this case, all the other Vermont hospitals and the Dartmouth Vermont resident experience. So in this case, hospital A had acuity 23% higher than the average. Hospital B had acuity 89% of the average or, or lower than the average. So then we take the payment and the costs and divide by this number. So after we apply the acuity, the average payment was 8,100 for hospital A, not 10,000. And for hospital B, it was 11,000 and likewise the cost. So on the surface, you can say the payment was the same, but hospital A had higher costs. But after we apply the acuity, hospital A actually had lower costs than hospital B. So that's why we look at it both ways, um, just to understand the acuity, since that's such a key component to costs. So I mentioned this, we, we computed the case mix scores for each hospital. And then we, the way we did that is that because different payers pay in different ways, we opted to use the grouping methodology that Medicare has for inpatient, it's MSDRG or Diagnosis Related Group Payment System and then it's outpatient prospective payment system or OPPS system. So we are not using Medicare's weights for each of the services to measure the acuity because those weights are specific to Medicare's experience. What we did is we put all the payers data together and recomputed these relative weights as they're called for those categories in those systems. That's why at the beginning when I mentioned that we're only using data in that's paid through Medicare's MSD or G or OPPS system. It's because we wanted to control for that when we computed these all payer weights. And so that's how we, we look at each individual service, whether it be an inpatient discharge or an outpatient significant procedure. And we determined a weight value for each of those services in Medicare's grouping system and we assign that weight value to every service for all payers um, for that hospital in our database. And we come up with a, a total aggregate case mix score. And that's what's displayed here. So without having to look at all the numbers individually, keep in mind that the average score is 1.0 in the system intentionally. So if you're greater than 1.0, you have a higher acuity than the average statewide and less than one is lower acuity. So that's why you can see on the, and this is done for inpatient services separately from outpatient because they're two different grouping systems. So you can see over the three years, HFY stands for hospital fiscal year, that the overall average hovers around 1.0. When we put the three together, it does equal 1.0. And same on the outpatient side. 
But if we look at it by peer group, AMC stands for Academic Medical Center, you can see Dartmouth has the highest acuity scores, but again, that's just the Vermont resident experience. Uh, UVMC is higher than its peers in the PPS or prospective payment system from Medicare. And then the critical access hospitals do have a variety of case mix scores. Some are higher because they're lower volume and have more specialized services like Mount Escutney, for example. But generally, the case mix scores are below 1.0 for the critical access hospitals. So that's why we want to look at everything uh, both with the case mix adjustment applied and without the application for comparison purposes. So let me stop there. I realize that's a lot of information and a lot of math to go through, um, but I can start to drill into each of the key findings unless somebody has a specific question. We can always go back to these slides later if you'd like. So I'll let me pause. Any questions, Any questions? Like this from the board or do you want to hold it till the end? Not hearing anything, Mark. OK. So as I mentioned in the beginning, the first thing that's very important to note is that um, this study that we have conducted for the board represents only 40 to 41 percent of the payments for the hospitals because of all those conditions I said up front. Not everything is in the VCURES database. It's Vermont residents only. Self-funded is not all in there. Um, it's limited to those things paid in Medicare's payment systems. So, and importantly, the professional component is part of a hospital's budget, and that is not represented in the study, just the technical side. So this is just showing you overall um, the payment amounts as a percentage of the total budget, which we received from the GM, uh, GMCB had a report that the hospitals are submitting. So no hospital is ever more than 60% and some are much lower. The average is 40 to 41%. So please consider that when you look at the findings. Um, as an example, for the hospital year ending September 30, 2019, we're talking about $685 million in our database of payments and 558 million of outpatient. You can see the distribution between Medicaid, Medicare fee-for-service, and all the commercial payers combined. And then you can see the difference between the academic medical centers, the PPS hospitals, and the critical access hospitals. So at the very beginning, you saw that the um, cost shift and the payment amount was much different between the commercial payers and the public payers, particularly for outpatient. So, but notice that a lot of our data on the outpatient side is the commercial side. So that's going to be driving these overall averages that you see to some degree, as opposed to the inpatient cost coverage was lower from an all-payer perspective. It was certainly lower for Medicaid and Medicare, but that's what's driving some of the overall weighted cost coverage on the inpatient side, because you can see the mix, you know, two-thirds of the data is the public payers. This is just to uh, hit home again that charges do not appear to have a direct relationship to payments or costs. So unlike the cost to charge ratio, which we're going to dwell on quite a bit for the remainder of the presentation, I just want to point out we also committed a payment to charges ratio. And you can see that overall across our study period in 2019 for inpatient, the payment to charge ratio was about 41% but it varies quite a bit by individual facility. And likewise, on the outpatient side, it also varied by facility and the payment to charge ratio is even lower on outpatient. So what that's saying is that on balance overall, 35% uh, of the charges on the bill were actually paid. That's what that's telling you. So now I wanna focus on uh, first the payment variation the next four slides are uh, composed in a similar manner. We're going to focus just on 2019 for illustration purposes, although we have the data for all three years available. Um, there are going to be two 
boxes on the next few slides. The first box is prior to applying that case mix adjustment, and the bottom box is with the case mix adjustment. The hospitals are ordered in the same format. The academic medical centers come first, then the PPS paid hospitals, and then the critical access hospitals. Further, you can see that the three major payers appear on the stick. Commercial is in the blue, Medicaid is in the green, and Medicare is in the black. So let's focus first on inpatient services only and the payment variation. So what you can see by the grid is that the payment variation, i.e. the average payment per discharge, commercial, the blue, tends to always be highest, but not necessarily for some hospitals in our data, at least for 2019. And furthermore, the spread varies by hospital. In other words, Springfield, they're all pretty much the same, the average payment. Uh, whereas like UVMC, commercial is higher, but the two public payers are very similar. When we apply the case mix adjustment to try and make it more apples to apples, the general trend is that commercial is still undoubtedly higher in most cases, with few exceptions, but there is some tightening, particularly on the public payers. The same uh, illustration is now shown for outpatient services in our study 2019. The top is without the case mix adjustment and the bottom is with. Here, this is where it's really pronounced where the cost shift is happening in that the average payment for the commercial payers is substantially higher than the public payers. And as you saw at the very beginning on the cost coverage, the Medicare and Medicaid cost coverage is pretty similar. And that's pretty much because the average payment is similar for Medicare and Medicaid for outpatient services. And when we apply the case mix adjustment, the finding is basically the same. Commercial is much higher than the two public payers. And in fact, in most cases, the public payers even tighten closer to each other. So in some cases, like the black box is actually sitting on top of the, the green circle. So that's the story on the payment side. But now let's look at the costs. So first we'll start with inpatient services. Again, it's 2019. So here, the co average cost per discharge, in many cases, Medicare is highest. Why? Because of the age of the patients and the acuity of the services that they're receiving in the inpatient setting. But when we do the apples to apples case mix adjustment, see how many of the sticks, the, the dots get closer to each other. In other words, the cost after applying case mix is more similar than we saw the same sticks on the payment side. And that's most clear when we look at the outpatient services. When we apply the case mix adjustment, the average cost per outpatient service, with few exceptions, is very similar between Medicare, Medicaid, and commercial. I'm going to briefly go back Look at the variation though on the payment side. Commercial is much higher. So that's why when I said at the beginning on the key finding that the variation is really more on the payment side than the cost side, particularly after we control for case mix adjustment. So that view is looking at all services combined of the, the inpatient and outpatient setting by hospital. Uh, by major payer in 2019. On the cost coverage, this is a bit of a repeat from the beginning, but to reinforce that the public payers in our data represent about 76% of all the services. So the fact that individually the two public payers are paying below 100% of their of the hospital's costs notwithstanding the fact that the commercial payers are paying more than costs, that's the public payers are bringing down the weighted average on the cost coverage um, in our study. And again, the 87% here for inpatient 2019 
is mostly indicative of the drop here on Medicare, which we are a little worried is, is on the low side because you can see Medicaid was steady at 73% and commercial was steady at 110%. So that's really what's driving that particular percentage. The next few slides are uh, displayed in a similar manner as well. So now we're looking at the cost coverage variation by hospital. This is all payers combined and the color coding uh, represents bands of the percent of cost coverage. So red being the most concerning that the cost coverage is less than 85% all payers combined. Then it goes 85 to 95%. The gray is like the mid range around actual cost covered 95 to 105. And then the green is most favorable. So, you know, without having to focus on any particular hospital or any particular year, you can see that the overall trend is that on the outpatient side, there's more green, meaning that the percent of cost covered is generally favorable for most hospitals from an all payer combined perspective. But a lot of the hospitals do not have their cost covered and some are most concerning below 85% on the inpatient side. So when we blend the two together to get the weighted combined, you can see that we have some pinks here, even if they're green on the outpatient side because the inpatient cost coverage is weighting down the overall cost coverage for the hospital. Now we look at the inpatient cost coverage only, but now we do look at it by major payer and by hospital. And so here it's even more glaring that Medicaid as a weighted average, as you saw, it was paying about 73% of costs. And that's pretty much true down the line for all the hospitals. On the Medicare side, um, there's quite a bit of red. All the critical access hospitals, like I said at the start, were forced to be 99% of cost. That's why they're all gray. And then commercial, there's certainly some green, but it's not all green because remember the cost coverage was lower on the inpatient side, even in the commercial setting, it was about 110%. And so we do see some red and pink as well. The different story on the outpatient side, Commercial, it's all green pretty much, except for Grace Cottage, a little bit of gray there. On the Medicare side, costs are not being covered on the outpatient side for Medicare. The critical access, again, we're forced to 99% just for Medicare. And then Medicaid, pretty steady, uh, around 71 to 76% of costs, and that's true for all the hospitals. We then looked at it by inpatient service category. Let me try and make this a little bigger because I realize we have a lot of data here. This is 2019 data only. We show when no case mix adjustment was applied on the left hand side and when the case mix adjustment was applied on the right hand side. These are our categories that I introduced at the beginning and then an all combined is at the bottom. So what this is telling you, for example, oh, and I'm, I should have said that we're using the same uh, coding here, although I noticed the commercial went, became yellow, not blue, but Medicaid is green and, and Medicare is black. So let's take um, uh, musculoskeletal. So here, the cost coverage for both Medicaid and Medicare is the pretty much the same and it's less than 80%. It's around 75%. Commercial musculoskeletal inpatient stays are more like 118% of costs covered. When we case mix adjust, it didn't really move all that much. Commercial came down a little bit. But that's different than let's say these um, intensive preemie NICU babies. Here, of course, there's no black square for Medicare because they don't have NICU babies in their database. But for Medicaid, it's about 80% of costs and commercial is about 140% of costs. But then after applying case mix adjustment, the Medicaid circle goes a little bit to the left 
and the commercial goes further out to the right. So we're trying to put these same NICU cases on an apples to apples basis. So all we're trying to show you here is that, first of all, the spread is wide on cost coverage at the service category level across the three payers. And sometimes the case mix adjustment closes the gap and other times it widens. We do the same thing for the outpatient services. Here it's a little more pronounced as you saw based upon the variation of the payment side in particular, the commercial with few exceptions is always much further out than the public payers. And Medicare and Medicaid tend to travel together and it's always pretty much under 100% for every category. When we case mix adjust, there is more of a spread between Medicaid and Medicare and the commercial sometimes closes in and sometimes furthers out. But suffice to say, we saw variation overall by payer, then at individual hospitals by payer, and now even by individual service categories by payer. I do want to touch on the cost coverage in one other way, and that is that Yes, it is troubling that costs are not covered in many situations, but I just want everyone to be mindful that it could be that the cost spread, average cost that is for the same service across hospitals also varies. So remember the whole concept of case mix is that we're adjusting for the acuity of different hospitals for their entire book of business. However, when we control for looking at a specific service, that would indicate that the acuity generally should really be the same for all hospitals for that individual service. However, what we are seeing is that there is also variation in the costs and in the payments to individual hospitals for individual services, not just the whole service category. And so I have four specific examples to show you, and that will pretty much close out my presentation. The first one is vaginal deliveries without complications. So there is a diagnosis group in the Medicare system called MSDRG number 775. And what I'm showing you on the top is in 2019, the, the weighted average payment uh, for vaginal deliveries was $7,518. For hospitals, had payments above that, and then others were below that. So there's variation in what the hospitals were paid for vaginal deliveries. But then when we look at the hospital's cost, there was also variation. So the grid here, you'll see this in the next few slides as well. The axis is cost coverage. The higher the cost coverage is the further out to the right, and the higher the cost is further up. So I have four boxes. The first one is the hospital on average has high cost versus their peers, but low cost coverage versus their peers. And I'm defining low cost coverage in this box as under 100% of cost covered. And I'm defining high cost as that hospital's bar is above the overall average. So in this case, there are four hospitals that had high costs and low cost coverage. There were no hospitals that had high cost and high cost coverage, but that's not going to be true in the next few slides. Then I have three hospitals that are lower cost than their peers, but also lower cost coverage. And then this is probably more the goal, lower cost, but higher cost coverage. So we, you know, that would be the aim. That's why it's in the darker green. Now, inherent in that, we also want to make sure that even if it's low cost, i.e. the hospital's more efficient, we want high quality as well. So they, we don't want to lose that those go hand in hand. But what I'm basically saying here is that, yes, there's lots of case mix and acuity differences across the hospitals in our study, but if we isolate it down to a particular service that everybody should effectively be doing the same, particularly this one's without complications, we are seeing a wide variation in costs and cost coverage down to the individual service level. 
I have one other inpatient one, and that's knee and hip replacements. Again, without complications, there's a separate category in the DRG system for those with complications. These are without complications. So again, I'm seeing a wide variety and without crosswalking every single slide, the same hospitals do not appear in the same box on these four exhibits I'm showing you. It varies by service. Here we actually have two hospitals that have high cost and high cost coverage. We did not see that on the delivery side. And then I have two outpatient service examples. One is the mid-level emergency department visits. So yes, there could be lots of different reasons why patients will go to the ED, but the general coding system, there's low level, mid-level, and high level. So I picked the mid-level. The average cost was $254 for those visits. That's what's shown here. And we have some hospitals above that and some below it. But again, we have a variety of scenarios between high and low cost vis-a-vis -vis their peers and variation in the cost coverage, high and low cost vis-a-vis -vis the peers. And again, it's not always the same hospitals in every box in all of these slides. They, they move all around based on the service. And then we have an imaging without contrast. So level one, there's five levels. So this is the lowest level imaging um, without contrast, you know, an MRI without the contrast. So it's like the, the most basic of those imaging services. The average cost is $144. That's here. They generally hug the average, but we do have some variation lower and higher. And again, we're seeing variation. So Bottom line, we have variation by payer, by hospital, by major service category, and by individual service category. So I wanted to close before opening up for questions, some considerations based on what we've seen in this presentation. Um, and I invite this for the board's consideration and any questions you may have for me about it. But one is that it does appear that regulating charge masters is really not influencing uh, ultimate percent of cost covered because I don't know all the history of all the different charge increases over the last couple of years, but you can see that even if uh, charges increased, that did not indicate that cost coverage increased in concert with the charge increase. Um, knowing that piece of information, um, the GMCB might want to consider developing some type of roadmap to kind of pivot more towards costs and cost variation and cost coverage as a lever in lieu of charges. Now, that is quite an undertaking, I understand. And the data today, I would consider the introduction to that concept. But knowing from the beginning what I said, we did not have, we only have 40% of all the payments in our study. We are missing some utilization from the all payer claims database. Um, there are multiple nuances that would be inherent in moving in that direction. Um, some of them that to me appear important for consideration is one, I think that there should be consideration given to the type of hospital. In other words, the academic medical centers versus the general acute care prospective payment system hospitals versus the critical access hospitals. I'm not suggesting that every hospital in the system should have or aspire to the same cost structure because they are inherently different if for no other reason than the type of hospital and the cost uh, inherent in that hospital. So um, that should be considered. Also, you know, we're hoping that the hospital stays sustainable, i.e. cost coverage over 100%. But that doesn't mean that the goal should necessarily be 100% cost coverage for every single service from every single hospital, because as seen on the last few slides, the costs even within a service vary quite a bit. Some of them are legitimate based on the structure of the hospital, but others could be, could there be efficiencies in some areas versus others? So you know, the financial reward should be on high quality, of course, first, but also efficient, i.e. lower costs going with that high quality. Um, I don't think that trying to say 
if the board wanted to take this route, going on a specific cost coverage value is realistic. For example, we want to aim for 105% of the cost or something like that, because hospitals inherently, you know, are trying to manage their costs in totality as opposed to individual services. So there needs to be some recognition that there could be balance there. So perhaps instead, something more like a band around a cost coverage range is something that might be a, a way to use this as a lever as opposed to a very specific number for cost coverage. And then as you saw, inpatient and outpatient service categories inherently have very different costs as well. So even if the, the band around a target cost coverage is uh, an area of exploration, it might be that there needs to be different cost coverage bands for different types of services because they're also quite different from each other. And then um, probably the number one thing is that, you know, again, today is considered the first view of the data, but if cost coverage was considered as a future metric, I do believe that there needs to be an additional level of scrutiny around the baseline data, i.e. what is in the vCures database and what is not in the database uh, for purposes of um, further analysis. So apologies for going quite fast through this, but I was able to get through it and I believe we still have time for questions. I'm happy to go back to any specific topic that the board members would like me to, um, but I will conclude and turn it back to the chair. Thank you so Thanks much, so Mark. Much, a lot Mark. of information in a short period of time. I'm going to uh, turn it over to board members for questions or comments. I can, yeah, uh, I, go ahead, Tom. Um, I, I have a few just, uh, I, I think, simple questions. But um, uh, so on uh, the page that you're up on right now, uh, yes. looking at yeah. item number two, you know, referencing how the Green Mountain Care Board uh, might consider using this information. But I have two questions. One, from a hospital administrator's point of view, as opposed to a broad regulatory point of view, um, what would what would you suggest to individual hospitals, which kind of look at this and and may see that you know they have high relative high costs. Would that suggest at the hospital level that they should look internally to reduce their costs? But if they're getting low payment from commercial pay payers relatively, that they should be chasing after their commercial payer, you know, for more um, uh, equal payment. Um, so I guess my question is, uh, have you apply? Has this been applied? Methodology been applied at the street level, and and what have you know, which I, which means the hospital level? And what what have what, what have been the results? So I am not and have never been a hospital administrator. So I'll start with that. But I would venture to assume that any uh, hospital uh, is certainly looking at this level of granularity at least on a regular basis because they understand that they are going to um, make a, a margin on some services and some for whatever reason might be a a loss to them and they're constantly balancing it's a balancing act for them um the exogenous circumstances they're faced with i mean they, they certainly are working to find efficiencies on the cost side wherever they can but the payment side if you're the public, if it's the public payers, a lot of it's out of their control other than lobbying maybe the Vermont legislature for an increase on Medicaid. And on Medicare, they're pretty much stuck with whatever Medicare says they're gonna pay them. So, um, you know, really their only true point of leverage is the commercial side. So my suspicion is that when they look at the balance of their payer mix, and the services under their payer mix, they are always looking for ways to um, strengthen the commercial payment side. And that's why you're seeing that in the outpatient, 
that the average payment is so much higher for commercial than the public payers because that's their first and maybe only avenue they have for that while looking at um, where they can find more efficiencies in the cost. The, the converse or the other piece to the, the coin is on the cost side is that, you know, hospitals generally, unless they've chosen by design to not offer certain services, uh, whether it be obstetrics or deliveries or certain surgeries or what have you, you know, they, they're kind of all comers for all patients. Um, so sometimes they're, because the volume is so low, they're not gonna be able to gain efficiencies on every service category because they just don't do enough of them. Um, so I guess that's a whole business model question is, should every hospital deliver every service? I mean, at the moment, they all have to have an ED, you know, to, for emergencies, but that doesn't mean they have to do every last surgery. Um, you know, I don't know the intimacies around what every hospital is covering or, or offering or not offering today, but that's always, you know, when the rubber hits the road, I think that's where the difficult decisions come. Maybe we should actually get out of this subcomponent of the business. Thank you. I'll, 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 uh, there's a limited amount of time. I do have a couple more questions, but um, uh, let Jess and, and, and Robin and Kevin so, so I don't suck up all the time. Thanks, Tom. We'll go to Robin. Thanks. Um, Mark, I was struck by um, your comment that the uh, cost coverage was similar between the public payers and that that uh, appears to be driven by the payment amounts. And I'm wondering if you could, what that makes my mind go to is some of the federal um, limitations around Medicaid payment, like the upper payment limit. And I wondered if you just had any thoughts or comments about that in relationship to this data and information. And if not, um, certainly we can talk about it later. No, that that's actually a very good point. Um, so for the layperson, there is a specific rule that state Medicaid agencies are bound to an upper payment limit in the aggregate for hospital services. However, the limit really is the percentage of allowable Medicare costs on the cost report. So it is not sometimes some analysts have compared Medicare payments against, I'm sorry, Medicaid payments against Medicare payments. However, as you can see in our study here, Medicare is not covering full cost either in every situation. So Medicaid agencies are not bound to pay. They can pay more than Medicare. That's the bottom line. They can't pay more than Medicare allowable costs, though. So that's an important nuance, particularly if Medicare is sitting at like 85% cost coverage. Medicaid is not stuck to pay 85% cost coverage. They could pay 100% cost coverage. They just can't pay 105% cost coverage. Thank you. That's really, uh, for me, that's very helpful in putting it in context in terms of looking broadly about possible avenues. Sure. Uh, um, that was my main question that popped in my head. I. I still have a lot. I still need to, time to digest, of course, a lot of the information since um, this is our first bite at the apple. So thank you very much for the very thorough presentation. Certainly. Thank you, Robin. Next, we'll go to Jess. Great. Well, thank you, Mark. I mean, this is so much work. I can only imagine how much work and how much time you spent behind your computer and your staff and your team there. Uh, and I, like Robin, I think it's a lot of information that we're going to have to take time to digest. Um, but I think it's really helpful as we think about our regulatory processes going forward, as well as as we think about our next agreement with the federal government. I think this is uh, important information for that. Um, and, you know, a little bit to some of the points that were made earlier, my hope is that the hospitals and the trustees of the hospitals and the community leaders will also welcome this analysis that you've done. Um, you know, they share the same mission that we do. They want to provide high quality, low cost care to their communities. And so I think the presentations that we're seeing now and the presentation we're going to see this afternoon are helping us give this holistic look at the whole healthcare system and, and may help us find efficiencies and lower costs and improve quality, which are goals that we all share. 
Um, you know, as I'm looking at this, you know, there was some key takeaways that actually I think are important, um, and I have to digest them a little bit further, but uh, it's very clear that hospital sustainability is going to be inextricably linked to payer mix, right? If we're looking at that cost coverage and we see all that red on those um, charts around what the public payers are covering in terms of, uh, you know, the cost of our care, even if we as a board allowed commercial rates to grow at rates that are higher than inflation to cover the cost shift and to cover margin needs, hospitals that have challenging payer mixes may not survive, right? I mean, that's the reality. If 76% of the uh, of the utilization is being paid by public payers, <laughs> the cost shift is clearly an issue for financial solvency of our system. So I think this is really important information that I'm hoping DIVA is looking at, the legislature is looking at. Uh, I'm hoping that we can consider it in our next agreement with the with CMS and Medicare. Uh, I think this is really important as we're thinking about sustainability. It can't all land on commercial payers. They are, are commercially insured. They're a shrinking population and they can't afford it. So I think this is really helpful. So that's just a comment. Um, I think the second comment out there I would just make is I think there's a common perception out there that our academic medical centers have the highest commercial payments and the highest costs. Um, but the data shown today shows that that's actually not the case once you adjust, as you said, for the case mix index. Um, you know, some, in particularly on the outpatient side, uh, you know, payments are higher at some of our smaller hospitals and costs are higher um, at our some of our smaller hospitals. And so I think to your point about thinking about how do we think about holistically this system and ensuring that the care is being delivered efficiently, but that we're also preserving access, um, I think it's going to be really important to be looking at these things going forward, particularly as we move to value-based payment, where hospitals are going to be held accountable for those costs. Again, we may have solvency issues if some of these hospitals um, are, are facing higher costs to deliver care because of declining populations or growing costs. So it's, it's really important. This is just the first step in that conversation uh, in our post-pandemic planning. But obviously, we're going to need to figure that out. But we're also going to need to preserve access to services. So there's a lot of work to be done here. Um, I guess my, those are my comments. My question is around some of your suggestions around looking at cost coverage rather than change in charge as a policy lever. I mean, clearly the, the analyses that you did here took a lot of time, required V-cures, required the cost reports. Historically, the board has not used the, the cost reports in our hospital budget process, but I'm, I'm clearly seeing the value in potentially using those. So I'm wondering if you can just speak a little bit more towards uh, how specifically, what types of questions we might ask in the hospital budget process or what what we might use from the cost reports ourselves internally to get closer to understanding cost coverage and understanding whether it's a reimbursement side issue or whether it's a cost issue, things like that. That's a long question. Sure. <laughs> um, so again, I mean, I would like to acknowledge that I think that hospital CFOs are looking at a lot of this data already. Um, so it would not be foreign to them what I've shared with you today. Maybe not at the categorizations I did it at, but certainly at departmental levels. Um, so it is a relatively involved process to do the assignment of the cost. It's certainly not insurmountable. Once you have a program to write it, we do follow the same consistent pattern for every hospital. It's just getting the inputs correct. I only mention that because it could be something whereby perhaps if there's specific um, categories of service that the board is most interested in, there could be some type of more simple Excel report that the hospital say their volume, the average cost per that service, the average payment for that service, and the board and its analytics team could look at it at the high level from a self-reported perspective, then there's always the option to validate things behind the scenes if there was more interest in exploration and all that. I mean, you know, or perhaps one of the team on the boards, you know, the staff would like to learn how to do the costing process. I'm happy to share that our method of how we do that with them too. So, you know, I don't think it's necessary for, I mean, it's the board has this discretion how they want the data presented to them, but do I think 
using the cost report as the source to get average cost per certain services or average payment per certain services insurmountable for hospitals to report? No, I, I don't. Okay, thank you so much food for thought here. I appreciate all the hard work. Certainly. Thank you, Jess. At this point, I'm going to open it up for public comment and questions. Members of the public? Can I ask a clarification question? Sure, Dale. I'll recognize you first. Oh, I'm sorry. I should have just raised my hand. Go ahead. Uh, my deepest apologies. Um, is he suggesting that we should align Medicare, Medicaid, and commercial so that all those paying rates are closer together, or is he acknowledging that's really not possible and hospitals need other sources of revenue to make up that difference because i can't ask somebody making 20,000 a year to pay the same amount as somebody making 100,000 a year i mean i liked his presentation but just it's so broad an overview to what is so many complicated issues underneath can he help simplify that for me where was he trying to pull that out or was he just doing the presentation for what it is thank you do you want to comment on that mark sure um well at the beginning, I articulated the, the asks of us about what to look at, which was payment variation and cost variation in every which way. So that's what we did. Um, to your comment, though, I, I'm not suggesting that all the payers should pay the same rate of payment for a particular service. First of all, I don't know if, I mean, right now the hospital's hands are tied, particularly when it comes to Medicaid and Medicare, in that the rates are published, you either deliver the service or you don't, and that's the payment you get. So I don't, I, back to the negotiating power, I do want to stress that I don't think the hospitals are in a high uh, negotiating position when it comes to Medicaid and Medicare and its reimbursement. Um, so the only true lever for negotiation is commercial payers on the payment side, and then maybe finding efficiencies and costs on the cost side. So, uh, Yes, it's it's a complicated issue, and uh, I do think that maybe one alternative for hospitals is to decide which services they really want to hone in on and maybe grow and make even more efficient, and other ones, maybe they just say, we're not going to do that anymore because the payers aren't paying us enough for it, and I think that's the reality of where the state of Vermont hospitals are right now. Okay, thank you. So next I'm going to call on Eric Schulteis and Ham Davis, you're on deck. Eric? Hi, thank you so much for your report, Mark. Um, the comment, well, the first comment is just really that um, board member Holmes, I think as the board thinks about moving into using the cost report data, um, there are kind of fundamental issues about the comparability of the board's adaptive data that hospitals report in and the S10, the Medicare cost report, or the worksheet on the S10. And we had raised a discrepancy um, several months ago and asked that the board and hospitals and the HCA come together. And I think as of right now, at least in my estimation, we don't know why those discrepancies exist. I don't think anyone's trying to game the system, but before we introduce, I think really good data and make decisions off of it, we need to understand what we can and what we can't do with it. Um, so that's the first thing. I was wondering, uh, Mark, in key finding three, um, talking about the, I guess, price discrimination between payers, um, how do you, like when I'm looking at that, 
that table, I'm understanding, okay, there's a clear inference that payers reimburse differently. But you moved, it sounded like you moved to a kind of, because payers reimburse differently, the cost shift occurs and the cost shift being that because of this payer differential, um, they charge commercial payers more. And I'm having a hard time understanding that leap in logic from a kind of using a descriptive statistic that this differential exists to a causal theory. So I don't, I'm not privy to, nor do I believe I should be privy to all the individual relationships that hospitals have with all the different payers. But let me give you an example of what I suspect might be happening, at least in some circumstances. And that is that I know that the Green Mountain Care Board is regulating charge masters, at least in the aggregate. So it's entirely possible that a hospital is charging for the mid-level ED visit the same to Medicare, Medicaid, and commercial payers, and for that matter, each commercial payer individually. But Medicaid and Medicare have established it says, we don't care what you're charging, this is what we're paying. So the delta between the charge and what is paid could be a reduction of say 60% below charges for Medicaid. Um, whereas maybe for one of the commercial payers, they negotiate what's called a contractual allowance of, we'll pay you 10% below your charge. For others, we'll pay the full 100% of the charge you give us. You know, the, the relationships can be very different for each hospital, for each payer, and sometimes for each service. So the baseline charges might be the same for everybody, but the ultimate negotiated rate, and I use negotiation in quotes because there is no negotiation with Medicaid and Medicare, it's what they pay. You know, you the effective payment, that's that payment to charge ratio. We saw it's like 40% in the overall. So that's that was my point was that um, the, the shift what we call the cost shift is really because if medic by by premise if medicaid and medicare are paying a much lower percentage of the charge that means that the hospitals have to get the pickup of what medicaid and medicare are not paying from the commercial payers so therefore even if the charge is the same to the commercial payers and the cost is the same for commercial payers they're just paying more than their fair share vis-a-vis -vis Medicaid and Medicare. So next I'm going to go to Ham Davis and Ann Sossen is on deck. Ham? Thank you, Kevin. Uh, Mark, my, I've got really a two-part question, if I can sneak in a second question that way. One of them is that you've got um, that the, uh, you know, when you, the cost, the, the whole universe of costs that you looked at were under 50%. And there's a lot of reasons for that, and I don't, wouldn't argue with any of them. But what I'm curious about is this on the, the first question. Is this, isn't there some way that, you, that your methodology can integrate at least of the, all, of, all the variables that you've introduced? And if, I'm, that's one of the best uh, uh, jobs of that that I've seen. Um, but the doctor, pe what, the professional payments are a huge factor, not only simply in terms of dollars, not in simply in terms of dollars, but simply because the the the, the doctors not only get money, it's the doctors that are driving what the what the hospital costs are anyway. Because every one of those decisions that generates a generates a fee there is is uh, is a is a doctor decision at base, even if it's only listed under under hospital services. So I'm curious about whether you could do that, and while you're thinking about it. One of the things that I'm curious about uh, most is that the, the, as the Green Mountain Care Board really tries to get a grip on this, and this is really the culmination of 10 years of trying to get, get our arms around this. The, uh, what, I, what I think is that there's, what, what I see anyway is two very different business models so that the, the uh, academic medical centers are not only doing higher uh, case mix indexes, but they are having it. They basically have a different kind of payment model, and they uh, they tend they they do research. They teach students. They tend to pay us pay salaries, whereas the 
rest of the hospital system is much more significantly driven by fee for service. So th those are my, th that's really a long question, but uh, a great job, it seems to me. That's one of the best I've seen. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'll address your first question. Um, so it, quite honestly, it just wasn't in our study or asked to include the professional component. Um, it could certainly be included. I do think it's it's probably the key piece of the missing link of the uh, you know database. And just to be clear, the 40% or so was 40% of payments, not costs. The one issue on the professional side is that it's, although it's a bit complicated, but through programming, the wonders of programming, we can assign costs to every service on the technical side easily through the cost reports. It's not quite as cut and dry to do that on the professional side. There are methods and I would uh, encourage if there was interest from the board, I'd like, you know, I think that hospitals should be consulted on that about assigning costs to professional service claims. We certainly have the payment side from um, the claims itself, but assigning the cost piece to get effectively a, a cost coverage for professional services. There's more nuance to that. It's not the same as the technical side, and I think that needs more exploration. But is it doable? Yes. Would it be perfect? Probably not, but it's doable. Okay, I'm going to call on Ann, and on deck will be Mike Del Treco. Ann? Thank you. This is Ann Sasson from Dartmouth College, and I have a question for board members on the broader hospital sustainability project that this work informs. Um, I am aware that health systems are facing a broad range of challenges beyond COVID-19, um, including growing workforce shortages and a high volume of patients seeking uh, deferred care. Um, that said, I would like to understand the governor's current position on these challenges. Would it be helpful if Governor Scott took more leadership on population health initiatives that require broader uh, coordination, including mask policies? Thank you. So, Ann, we're an independent body and we try not to answer for the administration. So I'm going to stick away, stay away from that uh, portion of the question, but I will say that um, the board understands the, the variation even in the sustainability analysis. And um, really what we're trying to do is have a conversation with Vermonters about what they expect from their, their healthcare system. We know that if we were to design it today, it wouldn't be designed the way it is today which is also true of our education system. We know the same thing there. But um, at this point in time, what we're trying to do is foster a conversation where we can try to um, come out with some creative ideas and strategies so that Vermonters have you know, the right care at the right time in the right setting and at the right price. And um, we're still in the uh, early stages of that, Ian. Mike Del Treco and then Dean French. Uh, good afternoon. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Good. Great. Thank you. <laughs> um, good afternoon and thanks for the opportunity to comment on this uh, variation study. I personally know how much work Mark has done on this and uh, appreciate his clarity and we have a, a, a long history of working together. Um, so as we navigate this discussion, I just want to make sure that there's an understanding that sometimes might um, be good for a good reason, it might or it should not exist, and then there's times where variation might be completely out of the provider's uh, control. Um, so I have uh, a general observation and then three points uh, related to variation planning for, for the future, and finally just some comments on uh, the finding. Um, as, as Mark outlined and described um, what was included and not included in this discussion, um, clearly uh, from, from our vantage point, public payment amounts continue to be a real problem. So to anchor the conversation, um, our provider community continues to face real challenges. And, and just to give that some flavor, in fiscal year 18 and 19, seven of our hospitals had negative operating margins. In 17, there were eight, and we have to go all the way back to 16, where there were just three. So uh, clearly cost coverage is only uh, part of this conversation, and we shouldn't be confused if we're at 95 or 
um, uh, what that means to uh, financial operations. So moving into uh, my uh, uh, comments related to variations, I, I just want to sort of give some flavors of why um, variation might exist for good reasons. And as Mark mentioned, uh, levels of acuity are one of those. Some others are service mix offered, um, availability, availability of specialty care, the increased cost of labor, whether or whether, whether or um, there are pr primary care physicians within the community, part of your hospital organization or outside of your hospital organization are also really important. Uh, some examples where variation can be problematic and should be worked on are readmissions and avoid unavoidable ED visits. The real problem comes when there are many times when these two examples overlap and become outside of the provider's control. For example, the increased co cost uh, of labor currently is largely being, being driven by, by workforce challenges. And um, the result is that our traveler use, usage is up. With that comes uh, forces that allow these agencies to capitalize on market opportunities completely outside hospitals control. Another example is inflationary pressures um, and great uncertainty related to supply chain costs. So our predictability and budgets and expenses um, really are, are for many times are at the uh, whim of the marketplace. So this these few examples clearly aren't meant to be all inclusive, but a list of why some examples um, are important and why listeners shouldn't conclude that organizations that have higher costs, um, there might be something wrong. So we can't conflate low cost with efficiency. And I think Mark really pointed that out. I wanted to comment on that. Under the uh, umbrella of planning for the future, it's very understated to say that the last two years have been challenging for the provider community and, and the responsibility prepared um, you know, as we prepare for the responsibility of our providers to prepare for the future is so critically important. And whether whether it's another pandemic, and I hope it's not, um, or some other healthcare crisis, or just caring for the aging demographics of Vermont is so critically important to this uh, discussion. Um, providers need to be financially secure. They need to implement tools to promote efficiency in their oper operations and take advantage of things like telemedicine, really important. Recognizing the dilemma of hospital sustainability and affordability should not come at the cost of reduced access and marginalized hospital missions is another important thing of planning for the future. So a few comments on the findings. Um, and this is my interpretation. I just read these this morning. Um, so. Um, if it's the goal to improve or move cost to cost coverage met metrics, in my estimation, the only real lever that the Green Mountain Care Board have, has is to restrict expenses, whether they be operating expenses at a high level or they uh, look at uh, service lines or, or they go into the bands of services, uh, um, uh, cost coverage as, as Mark describes. I believe um, that that could have some detrimental um, issues and outcomes. I think it will reduce patient access to services or move them in places where patients can't get to. Um, and secondly, it will certainly jeopardize hospital missions and dismantle current delivery systems um, access as we know them today. <clears throat> I say this because the only meaningful way to reduce or change expense structures without just sort of nibbling around the edges is to eliminate services and the first services that typically go or are considered to go are ones with low payment or cost coverage the outcome would be where vermonters uh vermont starts to export health care um, and in this case we'll still own the cost and no longer have the tools to regulate uh providers that that and, and have uh, reform goals met so clearly um, a lot of work here, and I, uh, uh, you know, I applaud Mark's um, efforts and his clarity and his presentation, and um, and the board's thoughtful consideration as we move forward. So, thank you, Chair Mullen. Thank you, Mike. Great comments. Um, next is Dean French, and then it's going to be Jessa Barnard. Dean. Thank you, Chairman Mullen. Um, and I'm going to desperately try to frame my comments as a question, which is just an illusion 
So these are comments. Um, Mark, I appreciate the data. Um, you know, generally speaking, data is data, and in this case, I would say it's good data, and not much to argue with. I, I think the next set of data the board's going to see this afternoon is fraught with challenges that are worthy of discussion. Um, I do think when I look at this, there's two major areas that I think are interesting. One is on Medicaid, and having spent my entire career in rural family medicine, and unfortunately somehow gotten sucked into hospital administration. Uh, the question about how does the CEO view this was an interesting one, because I, I have two feet in two sides of a pond, but I would say that the Medicaid provider tax in the state of Vermont is conceived of and working in a way that is counter to hospital and healthcare system success as compared to other states that I've had the privilege of working in. In my last uh, endeavor as a hospital CEO, we were able to invest in childcare, uh, high-end pediatric uh, services in a rural state, a frontier state, because 100% of the Medicaid provider tax was guaranteed to return back to the hospitals, and then it was leveraged with Medicaid expansion uh, back to hospitals that were just taking care of the preponderance of Medicaid patients. And so my hospital had a seven to one return for every dollar we, we paid in provider tax back to us, which allowed us to have pediatric specialty services, uh, behavioral health, neurobehavioral health, uh, a whole variety of services around women and children's care that on its face wouldn't have made sense. But we were able to do that because of the way the provider tax was structured and it didn't harm the hospital. So I get to Vermont and I find I pay out provider tax more than I receive back from it, which is an interesting, despite a payer mix, which is heavily weighted towards Medicaid. So I'll just put that out there. I, I realize it's a larger policy discussion, but I think the boards should be thinking about it. In terms of some of the data, you know, you can draw lots of conclusions from data and I can see a freight train coming down the track on some of this data. And I would suggest to you when I look at the hospitals around the state of Vermont, community hospitals, community PPS hospitals in the state, if I'm in Bennington, I have 88% inpatient market share. If I'm in Brattleboro, I have 85%. If I'm in Rutland, I have 85% inpatient market share. If I'm in St. Albans, Vermont, I have 53% inpatient market share, 53%. 47% of my inpatient care is being done somewhere else. I would submit to you it's being done in Burlington, which is interestingly, the strategic plan of this hospital over the last five years has been to divest itself of inpatient services at the expense of quality patient safety. And yet the core of an inpatient service cost-wise doesn't change much. So our volumes go down, but our expense stays the same. And so one conclusion would be, oh, well, divest of inpatient entirely and become a rural emergency hospital. I would say that would be a huge disservice to the Franklin County residents. The other is to leverage our academic medical center to invest in telemedicine services, to grow inpatient services at a low cost in St. Albans which is the track I plan to pursue as the CEO of this facility. And that's what you'll be hearing from me in, in the summer. So you need to know that. Um, and I think uh, there is huge opportunity for this facility to actually uh, improve the quality of care and keep the costs low by fully utilizing the inpatient beds that we have, which is now what we're doing today. And if anything, the pandemic has taught us is that we need those beds. Two weeks ago, I had 43 adults in 40, exactly 43 beds. We didn't have another bed in the facility and we had no place to put anybody. You know, so it is going, you know, building more beds centralized in Burlington, it doesn't help the residents of Franklin County. Optimizing the beds that we have here asking the academic medical center to invest in us with telemedicine opportunities in certain specialties 
is a, is a smart and economically sound strategy. And I'll, I realize in there, maybe there was a question, but I did announce at the beginning, I didn't think there would be one. I appreciate your time and Mark, I appreciate your report. So Dean, uh, thanks for those comments. And it's something that the, the board has uh, seen over time that, uh, um, and I think UVM acknowledges themselves that they need to, um, you know, really um, improve their, their telemedicine capabilities. And we've seen, for example, Dartmouth with the ability to, um, for Southwestern Vermont and Bennington to, uh, for a hospitalist to have a consult with a specialist in about 15 minutes time um, with video and everything. And um, those are the type of things that if we could catch up with what others are doing, um, would make a huge difference. So you hit something that uh, um, really would improve access, improve the quality of the care for the patient because they're getting the care right there um, without having to travel great distance. And it's uh, something that uh, um, we hope that uh, you have great success working with UVM to uh, achieve those end results. So with that, I'm gonna call on uh, Jessa Barnard and then I'm going to Richard. Thank you so much. Good afternoon. I'm Jessa Barnard with the Vermont Medical Society. And the data that the piece that jumped out at me was noticing that one of the very few areas where for all three payer categories, Medicaid, Medicare, and commercial, that was below 100% of costs was for clinic visits. So my question for Mark, especially with the kind of conclusion that this data may help drive some decisions about which services are offered at which locations or which are efficient to be offering, if we're trying to move as a state in the direction of really investing in primary care, building a primary care driven system and shifting away from acute care, how do we do that when clinic visits may be the least well reimbursed of all um, by all payers? How does that, um, how do you respond to those differing pressures? So uh, uh, your observation is good. Um, uh, and I saw that as well. I will say that because I have had some experience in looking at the clinic uh, costs in the state of Vermont, the federally qualified health centers and the rural health centers, um, there is quite a difference in the average cost for the freestanding non-hospital affiliated clinics than those affiliated with the hospitals. So um, I would be hesitant to make a leap that cost coverage is insufficient or incomplete across the board. I think there would be need to be a distillation between the freestanding versus the hospital owned clinics to really get to that differentiation in addition to obviously looking at the professional component side as well. But incentivizing primary care, I think everybody can agree with that. <laughs> so next I'm going to go to Richard and on deck is Mike Del Treco again. Hi, thanks Kevin. Uh, this is Richard Slusky. I wasn't sure if it was you or not. <laughs> I feel the last just thing. Richard, until your picture came up, I wasn't sure. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Um, hi, Mark. It's good to see you again. I think uh, this is probably the third study on variation we've done over the past 10 years. This is probably the most sophisticated, I would say. So well done. It's a, it's a great study. Um, I, I guess I want to twist this conversation a little bit. You can hear me now. Can you all hear me? Um, you know, we're four years into the all-payer model agreement with CMS. And one of the primary goals of the all-payer model agreement was to transition away from fee-for-service toward value-based payments. And so my, I think my observation is that this discussion seems to continue the notion that, that fee-for-service payments are going to continue over time. And that we're looking at cost-to-charge ratios, we're looking at these variation in payments and in in costs, et cetera, when I, I think may, I mean, I would suggest that the attention ought to be on how do we actually get to implement the goal of the all-payer model, which is to essentially do away with fee-for-service payments for the most part. 
and move toward fixed global payments for the hospitals, uh, uh, capitation or other value-based payments for the providers, profession, other professionals, et cetera. And I think, Mark, if I'm not mistaken, I mean, what you're indicating in your data is that if you look at Medicaid, Medicare, and Blue Cross Blue Shield and MVP, you, we're capturing almost all of the payments uh, that are being made on behalf of Vermont residents. Um, you know, so it's it just seems to me that that if we're going to be talking about things for the future or incorporating into the next model agreement, it ought to be how do we quickly move to away from fee for service payments? And I, I mean, from the beginning of our discussions around the all payer model, the agreement with the hospitals was let's not let's start where we are, but we're going to we're going to to limit the growth to a 3.5 percent. Maybe that's not enough given the extraordinary circumstances of the last year or two, but that the hospitals and other providers need to think about changing their business plans. And that doesn't necessarily mean cutting out services, but it may mean repositioning services. It may mean using more telehealth, as was earlier suggested. And, and a cooperative, the sense of cooperation and system building among the hospitals and other providers in Vermont. I don't think we can do this if we're just thinking about how does this individual hospital maintain all the services it currently has, or you know what, what what's it going to do to stay alive, or maintain itself as it is? It's people, hospitals, and the healthcare system cannot stay as it is, and meet both sustainability and affordability standards. So my suggestion is maybe maybe start thinking more about how these decisions that you make soon impact our ability to achieve the goals of the all-payer model. Or if you think the all-payer model is no longer relevant, then let's let's say that. So uh, that's, that's, I guess, what I have to say today. And I hope that's helpful. And thank you, Mark. That's, it was a good presentation. Your comments are always insult, insightful, Mark. <laughs> Richard, <laughs> thank you so much. Uh, Mike? Okay. Uh, Chair Mullen, that was a mistake. I've really never learned how to raise my hand, so don't expect me to do it virtually. <laughs> okay, great. Sorry about that. No problem. Is there any other public comment? Hearing none, I want to thank you, Mark, for a, a great discussion, and I'm going to place the meeting in recess until 1.30 when we'll um, start with the uh, next discussion. So I'll see everyone at 1.30. Thank you all. Have a good lunch. Thank you. 19 data. Um, I just, uh, because Dartmouth Hitchcock is not in your database, I just went to the Medicare cost report to get this. And uh, the uh, their last Medicare cost report uh, reported uh, discharges of uh, from the hospital, 18,752. Um, and we used your VCURS data to uh, to see how many of those were from uh, Vermont. Uh, the number that we uh, uh, we were able to find were uh, 4,354 uh, discharges at uh, Dartmouth Hitchcock that had uh, Vermont addresses. Now I will uh, note to you that this could be a bit understated because um, uh, essentially uh, your VCURS data doesn't include uh, people who are the uh, uh, facilities that are self. Uh, insured. So it, to the degree that those folks have not reported, there could be higher numbers here than that we see. So this will be a lower bound, but it gives you at least a sense of direction on what the impact would be here. Uh, the assumptions that we built into this analysis then were uh, that uh, we allow the, the Dartmouth-Hitchcock uh, increase to be proportional to the, uh, to the size of its, its current uh, uh, bed capacity. 
uh, Dartmouth Hitchcock hasn't announced publicly that I'm aware of a uh, a detailed plan for when it would implement the uh, with all this coming online. So we made a simplifying assumption to say that by 2026, let's presume that 32 of the beds are online, uh, that they're fa that they would phase it in gradually, and that the number of Vermont discharges would increase proportionally across the Vermont HSAs. Uh, obviously, the ones that are most heavily impacted are those that uh, currently have a lot of patients going there. The uh, Rutgers HSA, for example, is is one of those. Um, next slide. So essentially, uh, if we assume that discharge rates are remaining stable, length of stay is is uh, remaining stable as well, and that we're increasing uh, discharges proportionally from uh, Vermont HSAs, depending on the expanded capacity of uh, Dartmouth Hitchcock, uh, you basically see that uh, it would uh, add a 75% occupancy rate. Uh, Vermont would need eight fewer beds than we're already projecting. So as opposed to a, a reduction of 80, it would be a reduction of 88. So, which makes sense at about a quarter of their beds. So this proportional increase would, would reflect that pretty directly. Uh, as I mentioned to you, uh, Rutland would be, the, uh, would be the hospital that would be most directly impacted by that, I believe, uh, um, uh, because uh, it, it was, uh, I believe, an increase for them of uh, four additional beds, three or four additional beds uh, that they were being impacted by. Next slide, please. So uh, the numbers that I was showing before are all very uh, small and hard to see on these charts. So we wanted to put a, a larger chart here uh, for you uh, to, to give you a sense of here's the current licensed beds for many of these facilities. And if you were uh, looking at the bed need that would get you at a 75% capacity, this would be the projected uh, reduction that would be associated with that. Some of those are, are quite large, but again, it reflects the fact that uh, some of those hospitals have a, a um, occupancy rate that is, is already less than 75%. Okay, and I think I'm. Uh, I think we're ready to turn it over to uh, Beth Greskovich for uh, a quality discussion. Thanks, Patrick. I'm going to uh, present the uh, performance of the Vermont hospitals under the CMS Quality Pay for Performance programs um, for fiscal 21. So that's the most recent data that's available. And today, as we speak, Care Compare did update with some new fiscal 22 numbers. So as soon as this call's over, I'm gonna be checking out the Care Compare website. Um, so under the CMS Pay for Performance programs, there's three distinct programs. The first one is the Value-Based Purchasing Program, or VBP. And that is comprised of four domains, and each of those domains are weighted equally at 25%. There's a domain, uh, the clinical care domain, which includes mortality measures and complications. The patient perception or patient experience domain, which includes the HCAP survey. There's a domain for patient safety, which includes hospital acquired infections. And then the fourth domain is an efficiency domain, which looks at the total cost of care for Medicare fee-for-service beneficiaries. The VBP program is the only program that CMS has that allows uh, for rewards. So the uh, max uh, potential reward is a plus uh, 2%. The max penalty is a minus 2%. The interesting thing about the VBP program is that the penalized hospitals fund the rewards for um, the hospitals that do well. So um, the hospitals that are losing money under this program pay the hospitals basically that are doing well. The next program is the Hospital uh, Readmission Reduction Program, or HRRP. That program looks at the 30-day all-cause readmissions for six uh, specific clinical conditions. Those conditions are AMI, COPD, heart failure, um, hips and knee, elective hip and knee replacement, uh, pneumonia, and cabbage procedures. Those, um, this program is a penalty only with a max penalty of 3%. Um, each of those uh, clinical conditions that I talked about would be added together in total. Um, so it's not 3% per condition, it's in, in total. And then the last payment program is the HACRP or Hospital Acquired Condition uh, Reduction Program. 
that measures um, hospital acquired infections, the NHSN, so the abstracted data uh, submitted to um, NHSN. In addition, it also looks at the PSI 90 uh, uh, patient safety indicator composite. That is a penalty only, um, penalty only program and CMS penalizes the worst quartile in the nation. So all hospitals performance is ranked and then at the top quartile, they draw the line and those hospitals are penalized. We can go to the next slide. So this is a summary of key findings and Patrick, I'll have you um, go to the next slide so we can look at the visual while I speak to some of these findings. Thank you. So on this slide, we're summarizing for the Vermont hospitals, um, the six Vermont hospitals that are eligible, uh, their performance under uh, these programs. So we've got a heat map, which indicates how a hospital performed and how they rank within, um, within the nation. So we are showing quartiles there. So the first uh, program I'll talk about is the first column, which is HRRP for those six clinical conditions. In the table at the bottom, I have the financial results under those um, for the, that program. So as we look at HRRP, we see that all the hospitals except for one hospital received a penalty uh, for fiscal 21 under that program. We do see when we're looking at the top table that there are two hospitals that are performing uh, nationally in the top quartile. The difference in um, when we look at that is the HRP program had a change over the last year or two where you were grouped into a cohort based on your dual eligible uh, population. So um, the table at the top is based on the whole nation. So you're being compared against all 3000. But when we think about the, um, the payment, um, the payment policy that is based on a smaller cohort. So you're grouped with more like hospitals in terms of performance based on your dual eligible status. The next program is the HACRP program. So that's that penalty only program. So you can see um, two hospitals, uh, Northwestern and Brattleboro are in that um, bottom quartile and uh, received penalty. You can see two more hospitals are in, um, I would say the third quartile or the next worst quartile. Um, so sort of on the edge there of potential, um, potentially receiving a penalty in the, in the future. The third column we'll look at is VBP. So the value-based uh, <clears throat> value -based payment program and all hospitals in Vermont, except for one, receive a reward in that program. And even the one hospital that had a penalty, it was a very small penalty for Brattleboro at about $1,000. The next set of columns show the four domains for VBP. And you can see that under the HCATS column, uh, several of the Vermont hospitals, three of the hospitals are in the top quartile for HCAP, so that's the patient experience survey. And when I look at Vermont as a state, Vermont actually ranks 15th out of all the states in terms of their overall HCAP score. So that's uh, you know a, a great place to be when we look at that um, nationally, how Vermont looks on the um, patient experience. The next column is safety, which is the um, NHSN uh, acquired infections, hospital acquired infections. And we see two hospitals that have no data here. Um, there are uh, volume, um, uh, volume limits. So if you don't have enough volume, you're not eligible for, for those measures. <clears throat> we have the efficiency measure, which is again, that cost per uh, beneficiary. So you can see um, two of the hospitals are in the top quartile and three more hospitals are in that next best quartile. We've got the VBP clinical care, which consists of the measures that are listed to the right. So it's the mortality measures in addition to the complication, uh, standardized complication rate for hips and knees. 
So as we're looking at the clinical care uh, different measures, you can see that we have some opportunity in heart failure and AMI when we look across the state in terms of performance. Okay. We can go to the next slide. The next slide is showing uh, PQIs or prevention quality indicators. PQIs are a list of um, chronic conditions that if treated on an outpatient uh, in an outpatient or ambulatory setting could potentially avoid hospitalization. The conditions that are being measured are diabetes, COPD, heart failure, pneumonia, hypertension, UTI, and asthma in young adults. And all those, um, those conditions are uh, grouped together to, uh, to make the, the composite, and it's called PQI-90, the overall composite. This is a per capita based measure. So we look at this um, uh, on a population basis. When we look at Vermont as a state overall, their PQIs per 1,000 residents is 10.71, which is below uh, the benchmark of 13.06. The lower number per capita is better. The AHRQ uh, benchmark is uh, based on um, age and sex. So we do look at a risk adjustment for that underlying population to uh, um, account for differences uh, due to age and sex. Three of your hospital service areas are actually above the benchmark. Those are Bennington, um, Randolph, and Rutland. So those three uh, hospital service areas are slightly are above benchmark when we look um, at our data broken down. The one PQI where um, Vermont as a whole is above benchmark was the pneumonia PQI. And when we looked at the data in detail, we saw that 11 of the 14 uh, HSAs that for pneumonia, um, Vermont had a higher hospitalization rate for pneumonia uh, per 1,000 than the benchmark. And that's our quality summary. Thank you, Beth. So I'm going to turn it over to Patrick in a second uh, to talk about reimagining care delivery and address capacity and quality opportunities. Uh, so here what we'd like to do is just provide an overview of some of the other models uh, that are out there in other parts of the country. Uh, and again, we're presenting these for consideration as uh, Vermont policymakers and uh, the hospital industry kind of thinks about uh, capacity planning going forward uh, and the potential to utilize some of these models uh, to meet the needs of Vermont residents. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Patrick to walk through some of these models. Okay. And I think you stated that slide, so let's move to the to the next one. Um, so the uh, uh, one of the uh, ones that is being talked about right now, CMS has made some announcements about some possible programs in the future. One of which that's interesting is uh, hospitals uh, without walls. Um, uh, this was announced in March 2020 uh, by CMS, and it offers hospitals the ability to transfer patients uh, to outside facilities like ambulatory surgery centers and patient rehab facilities, even hotels or dorms, uh, to receive uh, and, and still be able to receive Medicare patients under specific circumstances. So, uh, kind of reducing the need for um, uh, to be inside the, the hospital with the full acute care services uh, for his, uh, for the full length of time that has been. Been, uh, traditionally the case. Uh, they've also announced another model, acute hospital care at home, uh, where participating hospitals, um, uh, they have to be capable of, of, of particular screening protocols and so forth at home uh, for medical and non-medical uh, non factors, because you want to be sure that the person is safe inside their home. Uh, you also want to be sure that some of the social determinants uh, of, of health that uh, we face are, uh, are not um, uh, barriers in those cases, like making sure there's working utilities uh, and there's uh, no physical barriers to the person uh, moving and so forth. So it involves screaming, screening and so forth. And also some uh, concerns about domestic violence. So there has to be considerable assessment. But if that's the case, it offers uh, the home as an alternative care setting for acute care. 
Um, the beneficiaries would be admitted from emergency departments and in inpatient hospital beds and would require an in-person physician evaluation to be able to uh, to be able to uh, activate this program. Um, the estimates are that hospital at home has the potential for reducing the total cost of care by 30 to 40 percent. So this model, uh, you know, in, in reducing, you know, not just uh, uh, nursing services and so forth and other skilled care nurse, nurse services within the hospital, but reducing lab services, uh, you know, and obviously things like food and so forth. Uh, and it also offers the potential for in, uh, increased patient satisfaction uh, and reduced readmissions because if the person can be cared for in place, it doesn't require running back and forth when the person's uh, to the hospital as the, the patient's condition is changing. Um, the obvious implication here, however, is that uh, if these at-home models increase, there's less need for acute uh, care capacity in traditional hospital facilities. So uh, if and when these types of models started to take hold, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the uh, the capacity measures that we have would still be uh, would be overstated. There would need to be fewer beds than we've even projected at the at the current stage. Uh, next slide. There are other models also of of acute care that are being offered out there that are recognizing. Uh, the fact that a lot of care is being shifted from hospitals and so forth. Um, and the fact that you don't necessarily need full blown facilities offering all services at every single location. One of those that's particularly intriguing, I think, is uh, the concept of a micro hospital. Uh, these are small scale inpatient facilities. They have a few inpatient beds, so eight to 15 short stay beds. Uh, they perform the same acute care services uh, and emergency services that are done at larger hospitals, but typically, typically on a lower acuity uh, basis. So they, uh, they don't have quite the same infrastructure needs and so forth, because uh, if you come to one of these hospitals and you need uh, a, uh, more, um, uh, a, a more uh, involved procedure, you would be transferred to, uh, to a different facility. But they offer the opportunity to offer care to patients uh, in a, a, a framework that is, that is cheaper and more efficient to operate uh, without having the full blown uh, services uh, available uh, within the location uh, saves money, but it does uh uh, it does uh, affect the access to care for those things. And so, for example, in a state like Vermont, M Vermont, where there's physical barriers to moving and so forth, one of the questions you would have to ask yourselves is uh, what services can be provided in other locations and what have to be provided on site uh, when you have drive times or, or transportation times that are uh, too far uh, for the person to actually access those services. So that's uh, those are the types of issues that, you know, they need to be addressed with it. But these types of hospitals began appearing as an outgrowth of freestanding emergency departments. Um, in fact, I know that I've talked with folks in Tennessee, for example, uh, who were looking at, for example, doing a freestanding emergency department, but uh, because of Medicare payment rules and the fact that their um, their sister hospital was uh, more than 35 miles from the mothership, uh, they, they couldn't do it without losing significant uh, federal reimbursement uh, for their Medicare patients. So those are the types of barriers that the federal government's going to have to think about in the Medicare program, in addition to just the, uh, uh, the uh, issue of getting access to the appropriate services. Can we get them uh, at the appropriate cost and with the appropriate reimbursement rules to make them viable? Uh, freestanding emergency departments are the other uh, option that that is happening in a number of locations. Uh, it's not physically connected to inpatient services. Uh, it has to be affiliated uh, with uh, a, a, a satellite hospital within a, a reasonable distance uh, uh, under Medicare rules in order to receive uh, the uh, full reimbursement that it would be uh, due as an emergency room. Uh, there's varying regulations depending on where you are in the country around these and so forth. But um, I live in Cincinnati. And I know that uh, there's a, a number of those that have been uh, built around the area, sometimes for uh, uh, financial reasons as much as access issues, but, uh, but uh, they are becoming a phenomenon that offers a, a potential opportunity here. There's also another uh, variation on this thing called freestanding medical facilities. They're kind of outpatient hospitals. And uh, uh, I want to talk about those uh, with a little bit more detail here. But if you can go to the next slide, Patrick. Thank you. Um, 
this is a specific Maryland issue, and uh, uh, since that's been uh, my home, I'll mention that uh, uh, to you a little bit. Uh, as Maryland has entered its own demonstration model, which much as, as you guys have been involved in and so forth, uh, they've been find, trying to find out ways to uh, reduce total cost of care in uh, facilities and so forth. And one of the issues uh, that has developed quickly under its system, which is, is considerably different with global budgets for hospitals, there's been a lot of excess capacity that's developed in the in the uh, system, and only uh, only by eliminating some of that can you get some of the savings that were needed they needed to generate. Uh, so Maryland has adopted a regulatory designation uh, called a freestanding medical facility uh, to allow uh, former acute care facilities to be decommissioned and uh, transitioned uh, into a different clinical uh, delivery model. Um, it includes emergency services observation beds, uh, mental health, and uh, robust outpatient services. Um, in fact, one of the most innovative uh, applications of this has been um, uh, the transformation of a specific inner city hospital, uh, Bon Secours Hospital in Baltimore City. It was uh, an aging uh, facility that had been struggling financially for a number of years. Um, it was largely dominated with government payers, so you uh, essentially had Medicare and Medicaid that dominated most of it, and the rest was uh, the uh, was uncompensated care if the patients were not covered by a, a, a uh, by a governmental payer. State subsidies were required to keep the hospital operating, and uh, essentially uh, it had an ancient plant that was desperately needed, it needed investment and so forth. Um, and while Maryland's system didn't have uh, safety net hospitals, this is one that kind of was, I guess, close to uh, fitting that definition. At any rate, uh, under the existing model, uh, these freestanding medical uh, facilities allowed the transformation of this particular facility into a new hospital, uh, uh, Grace Medical Center. Um, it, it was transformed, uh, you can go to the next slide, Patrick. Um, a new facility was built that offered emergency care, inpatient and outpatient mental health services, renal dialysis and uh, diagnostic services. and Along with that, uh, and the emergency room continued to operate. In addition to that, there were offsite locations uh, that uh, offered primary care, which is, was a huge need in the area, along with drug treatment, outpatient mental health uh, services. So this is one where the state was very innovative in applying its federal waiver and the state designation in order to, uh, to do something that was a real benefit for the community, keeping services there that needed uh, to be there, and then finding alternatives alternative services for those uh, that had uh, that needed uh, inpatient care, uh, which was actually uh, plentiful in Baltimore City. So this was an innovative application of that approach. And it's one example of how reimagining re the delivery system uh, could, could work. Um, and, uh, and the Maryland model uh, offered that as a, a nice, uh, a nice possibility. Next slide. And uh, is uh, one of the commentators earlier referred to the rural emergency uh, designation uh, is is also an option that is being proposed by CMS. Well, it's been required in federal law, and CMS is currently working on the uh, uh, is working on the the rules for it. Uh, there's a lot of interest out there uh, in this. Uh, I know that uh, we've we've talked with folks in other states who are very interested in the possibilities that this offers. There's uh, there's specific uh, guidelines for who's eligible for it and so forth. I won't go through blow by blow on each of these and so forth, but it offers the possibility of uh, much like a freestanding medical facility of focusing on emergency services and uh, reducing uh, um, and and reducing kind of the uh, inpatient uh, uh, footprint there. So as as this says, the eligible hospitals are uh, critical access hospitals and and uh, hospitals with 50, 50 beds or less and uh, uh, in located in rural areas um, uh, and so forth. So we'll we'll see how CMS operates this and so forth. But the idea of making sure that basic services are in place for emergency care with the possibility of transport to a, uh, a facility that can handle more sophisticated uh, 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 clinical needs than is kind of a constant theme in some of these alternative models. Uh, next slide. And finally, uh, ambulatory surgery centers are also something that uh, is uh, needs to be discussed because they often offer uh, less expensive opportunities for care that can be uh, handled in lower acuity settings. Um, uh, the uh, 
in some of the work that we've done looking at, at Vermont just for this uh, for this uh, presentation and for our for our work, we were seeing that uh, Vermont has the lowest number of uh, ASCs uh, per capita uh, in the country. Uh, so uh, one of the I issues uh, is, you know, in, in deciding where you want to offer care is, do you keep it in your current inpatient facilities? Is it cheaper to move it to the other facilities? Although one issue that you do have to address is when you free up that, uh, when you uh, open a new ASC, are you spending more on new capital and getting lower prices there, but you're leaving uh, unused capacity? Uh, is it wise to abandon that existing capacity? So those are the types of trade-offs that I think that you need to uh, to to think about. But it is. Uh, obvious uh, over the last several years that changes in clinical services have made it possible to move more out of the inpatient setting to outpatient settings where knees and hips, things that used to be done uh, inside uh, the hospital can now be done on an outpatient basis and so forth. So, And those trends are likely to continue uh, uh, along the way here. Patrick, I'll turn it back to you here. Great, thank you, Patrick. So what we wanted to do now uh, was in thinking through uh, kind of where there may be potential areas of opportunity uh, to improve hospital sustainability and prepare for that value-based world. Uh, we reviewed data across a range of factors, many already touched upon by Patrick in the initial capacity analysis uh, and Beth when it came to the quality uh, piece of it. Uh, based on our analysis, we believe that each of these factors is critical to sustainability in a value-based uh, care framework both in the aggregate for the state of Vermont, as well as looking at it at the individual hospital level. Uh, and so what we ultimately did is we created criteria uh, and cut points for each of the factors to determine where there may be areas of uh, opportunity. And what we sought to do was create cut points that would show differentiation between the hospitals, uh, either within Vermont itself or against some objective uh, benchmark, like the PQI one that Beth uh, specifically had pointed out earlier. Uh, but we recognized that uh, each of the cut points that we chose uh, could certainly be up for uh, discussion, depending on how you wanted to uh, look at things. Uh, and certainly the areas of opportunity, which we'll get into, are meant to be a starting off point for discussion. Uh, and there will need to be uh, more discussion with policymakers uh, and industry leaders to determine the best course of action going forward, uh, even in some of the areas that may be potentially identified here. So the criteria that we used uh, based on the analysis that was previously walked through uh, was we did look at the inpatient occupancy rates for adults and pediatrics, uh, the occupancy rates for intensive care units, uh, and we looked at those separately because those may separately drive towards different uh, areas of opportunity and recognizing that some facilities don't have uh, intensive care units. Uh, we did look at the projected bed need for 2026 and how that could potentially impact things the emergency department use rate per 1,000 residents. So again, that will be by uh, the, the HSA, so not necessarily for the hospital specifically because it's a population-based metric. Uh, similar for the PQIs, the prevention quality indicators. Uh, we did use uh, the some of the information that, uh, that Mark presented by Burns and Associates around case mix adjusted average cost per inpatient discharge, uh, and that is for all payers. Uh, now we recognize that the, the limitation to that is it may not necessarily reflect uh, cost by different service lines, which is absolutely something uh, that should be teased out. Uh, but we were looking for something directionally correct that would point out if there were potentially higher cost facilities uh, versus others when you look at an all payer basis. Uh, we use CMS star ratings as a proxy for quality, but fully understanding to the presentation that Beth gave earlier uh, that there are many layers to quality underneath just the overall CMS star rating. Uh, but we did want to use something that was uh, you know, objectively used by CMS to at least uh, use as a proxy to help steer in certain directions. Uh, we used drive time to nearest Vermont hospital, so we didn't use the uh, distance in miles, but rather the drive time, uh, recognizing some of the geographic barriers and other things that may be in place in Vermont uh, that would cause you know, a 10 mile drive to take 30 minutes. And so we wanted to factor that in and make sure that that was accounted for. Uh, as well as the age of plant. So that was one thing that we uh, specifically looked at is what is the age of the facilities? Uh, older facilities may have uh, newer capital uh, requirements uh, and there are other reasons why you might, might want uh, to try to uh, use, uh, use services within a newer type uh, facility. So for each of these, uh, what we did is we looked at uh, by hospital, uh, where did each of them fall? So using the 2019 occupancy rate for each of the hospitals, uh, and then facilities with lower occupancy rates 
Uh, we identified may be eligible for uh, right sizing. So do you need all of the uh, beds that you have there currently? Is there a potential to consolidate services across facilities? Uh, or is there potential to transition to a different care delivery uh, model? And for purposes of the analysis, uh, we had marked red as less than 50% occupancy, 50 to 75 was yellow, and then greater than 75 uh, was green. And you can see the distribution uh, across the, the different sites. Uh, with you know the high being up uh, at northeastern uh, regional at 82, uh, and then some of the lower ones such as Brattleboro currently sitting uh, at 36 percent. A similar analysis for the occupancy rates for the ICU, uh, and so you can see the distribution there as well as the various cut points that we used. I uh, did want to flag one uh, one uh, uh, caveat here, which is uh, an NA is listed for Northwestern Medical Center because. Again, this was based on uh, the reports that we were using. Uh, however, uh, it's our understanding from communications with GMCB uh, that Northwest does have four uh, four bed ICU. So uh, we didn't want to to uh, make a change because the, the we wanted to keep the data sources consistent. Uh, but we did want to acknowledge uh, that particular fact uh, as we looked at this. The third criteria that we looked at is that projected bed need, and this is consistent with uh, with what Patrick shared earlier. Uh, so again, just looking at uh, the bed need by each of the hospitals and hospitals with reduced bed need may present opportunities for efficiency. Uh, and so wanted to factor that in uh, to the overall with red being a bed reduction, yellow being no change and green being a bed uh, increase. The fourth criteria that we used uh, was the ED use rate per 1000 residents for the HSA. Uh, the one thing uh, that I want to call out uh, looking at the chart on the right is that uh, Grace Cottage and Brattleboro are both within the same uh, HSA. Uh, so we use the same number because it's a population based measure uh, for both of those, uh, but just recognizing that there are two facilities within that specific uh, HSA. Uh, we looked at the Vermont uh, average, and so if the uh, facility was above, or I'm sorry, the HSA was above uh, the uh, Vermont average, uh, we marked that in red. Uh, and we marked it below if it was green. Uh, now we did uh, look at uh, other states and the ED utilization to compare it, um, but we wanted to use a Vermont specific uh, comparison uh, due to some of the, the questions that came up around uh, the benchmarks uh, that had previously been used. And so we wanted to just, again, show the uh, comparative nature of ED usage uh, at the population basis across each of the HSAs. Uh, the fifth one is the prevention quality uh, indicator. So again, uh, Brattleboro and Grace Cottage sharing the HSA will have the same PQI overall composite uh, and consistent with Beth's earlier presentation. There are three uh, uh, three HSAs that do have a higher PQI overall composite uh, than the AHQ, AHRQ benchmark. Uh, and those are associated in the hospitals within those uh, jurisdictions. Or, I'm sorry, the HSAs are listed. So Gifford Medical Center, uh, Rutland and then Southwestern. So I wanted to uh, point those out as another data point. The sixth criteria that we used was the case mix adjusted average cost per inpatient discharge for all payers. Uh, and again, thank you to Mark and the team for the analysis uh, that they did and that we uh, used for this piece of it. Uh, we did create cut points to show uh, outliers and again chose cut points that would show differentiation between uh, between each of the facilities to show a uh, distribution across them. Uh, and so although cost differentiating differentiation exists by payer, uh, the stratification by all payers demonstrates still just demonstrates distinct differences across the hospitals. Uh, and so you can see some such as UVM Medical Center as an academic medical center, you would expect uh, that to be a, a higher cost uh, per inpatient discharge. Uh, but there are some others, Grace Cottage and Mount Escutney, that uh, are flagged as higher cost type facilities. And there may be reasonable reasons why those are higher costs, but it's at least something that we would say uh, that should be looked into to see if there are, uh, are opportunities there. For the CMS star ratings, uh, we use those again as a proxy, recognizing that there are many other ways uh, to measure quality, including much more detailed analysis that Beth and her team had previously uh, conducted. Uh, and so if they were a, a, red, a red hospital, it was one or two stars. Yellow is three and green was four or five. Uh, and so you will see that uh, Vermont uh, is fortunate to have some four and five star uh, facilities, uh, but there are still some other hospitals with room for improvement. The drive time to the nearest hospital. So again, we use drive time rather than physical distance uh, to measure this. 
uh, for the cut points, if there was less than 30 minutes, it was green. Uh, if it was 30 kind of on the dot, that was yellow. And if it was greater than 30, uh, that was red. And you will see some of the ones in red, there is a significant uh, drive time that would be necessary uh, to get to the next nearest facility. Uh, and we we wanted to consider that going back to the uh, access concerns for uh, residents living in those particular HSAs or using those particular hospitals. You know, that is it reasonable to have a, uh, a patient have to drive uh, 60 minutes to get to the next nearest facility if they need a, a specific type of care, uh, or would you want to keep them closer? However, if there are certain facilities that are closer in distance and have lower occupancy rates, does that present a potential uh, opportunity? Uh, and as we think about the different types of care delivery models that Patrick walked through earlier, it's not necessarily saying that these uh, facilities are not needed or that all of the services that are provided are not potentially needed, but it is a way to say that there may be different models that could still meet the needs of the community and provide access uh, without causing too much travel time for patients that need these types of services. And lastly, as we did look at the age of the plant, um, so the age of the plant for each of the hospitals uh, was considered. Uh, a higher age of plant may reflect deferred maintenance and a higher need for capital investment going forward. Uh, and there have been studies that have shown that hospitals with newer physical plants perform better on value-based purchasing uh, measures, including patient satisfaction. And so when we were looking at this, we calculated the state average at 14.3 years. And so if a hospital was less than that state average, they were green. If they were on the state average, they were yellow. And if they were greater than that, they were red. Again, to show differentiation between uh, facilities for purposes of uh, comparison. So then what we did is we looked at uh, all, all of those opportunities and there's a, a larger grid, as you can imagine, that stacks all of them up against each other to try to just uh, provide directionally, uh, directionally relevant uh, information that may be helpful to dig into further. Uh, and so we frame these as opportunities. So these aren't hard and fast recommendations where we would say you definitively should do these things. Instead, we're saying these may be areas based on all of the areas that we just previously explored, the criteria that we used and the factors that were considered to say these may be things that you should consider going forward. And so as we've reviewed the potential areas of opportunity, uh, we tried to bucket them into four uh, distinct categories. So one are any uh, areas of opportunity around steady state. So um, opportunities given the current demand for inpatient services, demographics and other things like that. So if if the if the care delivery models you know haven't changed, if the demographic trends hadn't changed, uh, all things being equal, are there any areas of opportunity where we would, where we would say uh, that the state of Vermont and the policymakers and industry should really look at these to see if there's area of opportunity? The second one was acute care model changes. Uh, so that is, are there any facilities because of some of the metrics that we previously looked at where we would say? Uh, the state of Vermont should consider if there's a different care delivery model for those particular sites, which could still meet the needs of the population, but potentially do so in a different way uh, that may be more cost effective. Uh, and what you would still want to ba uh, balance that with the quality of care that's being provided. We did create a third bucket around value based care. So this is focusing on care that doesn't necessarily need to be provided in the hospital if different resources were available. Uh, and so we wanted to put, uh, point out some of those potential areas of opportunity, which may involve additional study uh, in order to determine uh, how much there could potentially be. And then certain regulatory enhancements. So opportunities to utilize regulatory tools to promote hospital stability and the shift to value based uh, payments. Uh, so not implementing regulation for the sake of regulation. Uh, again, having been on the hospital side, there's always that balance between uh, administrative burden and regulatory oversight versus the need to ensure uh, and adequately protect uh, the patients that are being served by the individual facilities. The first area of opportunity that we wanted to discuss, uh, and each of them are framed as a potential opportunity on the left, uh, and then the rationale on the right. And in the rationale, you'll see that the uh, the criteria and the factors that we used uh, in the previous uh, section of the deck uh, are what's flagged as the reasons why this is something that could potentially uh, looked into. Um, but again, these are uh, factors that we uh, picked out and assessed, but should absolutely involve additional discussion uh, locally with you all there. So the first is uh, the potential to transition inpatient services from Grace Cottage to Brattleboro. 
Uh, so both facilities have lower occupancy rates. Uh, you'll see Brattleboro is actually lower at 36.1 rather than Grace Cottage at 56. Um, there is projected bed need of a decrease at both of those facilities. And so uh, if both are already at lower occupancy rates and there's uh, a potential reduction uh, in the beds that may present additional opportunity. Since both of those facilities are within the same uh, HSA, uh, it's a shorter drive time between those two facilities and you still need uh, two acute care hospitals within the same HSA. Uh, the cost per discharge, so Grace Cottage does stand out as one of the highest costs per discharge in the state, uh, potentially reflective of the specific services being provided there, but again, something to look into. Uh, and the age of plant for Brattleboro is about 10 years less uh, than Grace Cottage. So if you were potentially able to uh, transition some inpatient services from Grace Cottage to Brattleboro, uh, could there potentially be a longer uh, life of the age of the plant there, uh, which would mitigate the need for capital improvements for a longer period of time? Uh, and again, they both serve the same uh, HSA. Uh, the second area of opportunity under the steady state uh, bucket is to transition inpatient services from Springfield to Mount Escutney. Uh, so Springfield has a low occupancy rate at 45.8. Uh, Mount Escutney does have a higher quality rating because we do want to uh, make sure that quality is being assessed uh, as much as uh, anything else. Excuse me, sorry about that. Uh, the travel time, it is a 30 minute drive time between the facilities, so being mindful of longer drive times, which may uh, be prohibitive. However, this one only being 30 minutes may potentially provide an opportunity. Uh, and then the age of the plant, while not as dramatic as the previous uh, example, uh, there is still a five year age of plant difference between Mount Escutney and Springfield, uh, and does that potentially provide uh, an opportunity? A number three under steady state is to transition uh, the Gifford ICU services to central Vermont. Uh, so Gifford currently has a small ICU, only two beds and a low occupancy rate of 32.3%. Uh, although the central Vermont ICU has a higher occupancy rate at 56%, uh, it still does have uh, capacity. Uh, the cost per discharge between the two facilities is relatively comparable. Uh, and Central Vermont is one of the five star facilities uh, according to the CMS star ratings. The travel time is about 30 minutes between the two facilities uh, and you will see the age of plant for Central Vermont is about seven years uh, earlier. So given all those factors, is there the opportunity to transition the ICU services from Gifford to Central Vermont? Area of Opportunity number four under steady state is to transition North Country ICU services. Um, this one is uh, potentially a little uh, trickier. There are a couple options uh, to, to consider. Uh, one is to move ICU services to Northeastern Hospital or to develop some sort of transfer protocol to UVM. Uh, the reason we particularly looked at the ICU there is that North Country has a low occupancy of about 8%. Um, however, we are aware that the nearest hospitals are Copley that does not have an ICU or Northeastern, uh, which is at 46% ICU occupancy. So they do have some capacity there, but both are 60 minute drives. Uh, and so as you all think about it, even if you uh, decide that maybe you don't need to continue to maintain an ICU in North Country, given the high uh, overhead costs of maintaining an ICU, um, is the drive time too far to those other facilities? And would you want to come up with some sort of uh, transfer protocol to UVM, uh, Medevac or otherwise? Uh, and of course, you would have to better understand what the kind of cost benefit analysis is to that. Uh, and again, recognizing the drive time for uh, patients that might uh, or loved ones that may want to visit patients uh, or other things like that. So all of that would need to be considered in the mix. But again, if you have an ICU rate uh, that is uh, sitting at 8%, it's worth looking into. Uh, opportunity number five in steady state is to transition Northwestern ICU services to UVM. Uh, so Northwestern has a low number of ICU beds uh, and a low occupancy rate. It is a 30 minute drive to UVM and UVM does have a higher quality uh, star rating. Uh, recognizing, however, that UVM is a higher cost uh, facility. And so that, of course, always needs to be balanced uh, of what is the cost associated with continuing to maintain uh, that low number of ICU beds at Northwestern or other uh, 
facilities for that matter, uh, with potentially moving it to a higher cost facility, but that may have the volume to sustain uh, an ICU. Uh, because when you think about low uh, occupancy ICUs uh, versus higher occupancy ones, how does that impact uh, the quality of care? How does it impact uh, nurse retention and recruitment rates and all those other sorts of things? So all of that will need to be uh, factored in, but again, uh, just an area of opportunity potentially dig into further. Uh, again, for a steady state, an area of opportunity is uh, the consideration of creating centers of excellence for certain types of care. Uh, and so one of the examples that we just wanted to raise, although it's not necessarily uh, the only one, but just as an example for uh, discussion, uh, is orthopedics. So most of Vermont's hospitals perform orthopedic uh, procedures. Uh, however, in looking at the LeapFrog Group's uh, minimum uh, volume standards uh, that have been established, uh, there are several facilities, uh, both for total hip and total knee, that don't meet the 50 annual uh, uh, threshold that they have uh, set. Uh, and so you'll see under total hip, uh, Copley, Gifford, North Country, and Springfield uh, do not meet that 50 volume threshold. Uh, and for total knee, you'll see Gifford, North Country, Northwestern, Porter, and Springfield uh, similarly uh, don't. Uh, now, I know one of the, uh, the, uh, the questions that will come up is, you know, are there surgeons that uh, provide services at more than one facility? Um, because LeapFrog has established these thresholds both at the hospital level uh, and as well as the indi individual physician. Uh, and I guess the one thing I would just say for additional consideration there is, you know, even if the individual physician is or surgeon is providing these types of services at more than one facility and therefore uh, moving beyond the threshold, uh, there is still the consideration of the uh, the other staff, the nursing staff, the techs, the others that have to be involved uh, in those procedures, as well as the uh, operating room uh, capacity uh, and uh, uh, technology suite and other things like that. And so even if an individual surgeon may be meeting the threshold, uh, is it still worth a look at some of the, the hospital type thresholds? And is there the ability to look at creating centers uh, of excellence uh, to ensure that uh, higher volume uh, type service lines are being uh, being created in order to create uh, greater value for Vermont's residents. Uh, pivoting to acute care model uh, delivery changes. Uh, so we did want to just flag a few examples, but these aren't necessarily the only ones uh, of how you could convert facilities with lower inpatient occupancy rates, a small or no ICU, and higher ED volumes into an alternate care delivery model. Uh, and just flagging some of the ones that Patrick had previously raised. So the Rural Emergency Hospital, the Freestanding Emergency Department, Freestanding Medical Facility, which is really an outpatient hospital, uh, or the use of hospital uh, at home. And so we flagged uh, two of these, uh, of the current facilities, Northwestern with a you know 40% occupancy rate, uh, a reduced projected bed need, and a uh, ED rate that is higher than the Vermont average. Uh, similar dynamic with Springfield with a 45.8% occupancy rate and an ED average that is similarly above uh, the Vermont average. Is there the opportunity to still maintain services uh, either at those sites or one close by, but certainly within the same HSA, uh, but provide the types of services to the residents of those HSAs in a different way uh, that still meets their needs, uh, but doesn't necessarily require uh, the full-blown hospital that currently exists there today? Uh, when we think about value-based care, we also had a few recommendations for uh, consideration by Vermont's policymakers. Uh, one is to conduct a study to quantify the low volume care being provided in Vermont's hospitals and to potentially use regulatory tools uh, to create financial incentives to reduce it. Uh, so uh, different organizations have looked at low value care and defined it due to services that provide little or no benefit to patients, have the potential to cause harm, incur unnecessary cost to patients or waste limited healthcare resources. Uh, some of the examples uh, include low back imaging within six weeks of onset, branded drugs when generics are available, uh, and they list uh, several others. Uh, in 2014, the Commonwealth of Virginia reported spending $586 million in unnecessary costs using data from their uh, all payer claims database. Uh, now this uh, in many ways involves a, a cultural change in addition to the quantification of these numbers. And so I don't want to, to minimize the effort that would be needed to uh, move the needle on something like this, but it's at least worth understanding how much of this type of care currently exists within Vermont. Uh, and is there the opportunity uh, to create financial incentives uh, to reduce it, which would be beneficial uh, not only to the total cost of care, uh, but certainly to the patients that may be uh, utilizing these services currently. 
Uh, also along the lines of value-based care, so uh, the potential to conduct a study to quantify uh, low intensity services and potentially avoidable utilization being treated in Vermont's hospitals uh, and utilize regulatory tools again to create financial incentives to reduce them. Now, when we think about low intensity services, we're thinking about things like outpatient procedures that could be done uh, in an ASC as an example. So you think about endoscopies, colonoscopies, uh, other things like that, that don't necessarily need to be done in an acute care hospital, uh, but could be done in other settings at a lower cost. Uh, thinking about PAU, uh, we're talking about acute inpatient admissions and ED visits that can be reduced by timely primary and preventive care. Uh, Patrick touched on those uh, earlier. Uh, and so, you know, working with the primary care community, federally qualified health centers and others, uh, is there the ability to reduce uh, PAU that is currently occurring within uh, the hospitals? Uh, we do know that several Vermont hospitals have higher than the state average for PAU, uh, PAU associated revenue. Uh, Copley, Gifford, Grace Cottage, North Country, Northwestern and, uh, and Springfield. And so again, is there an opportunity to reduce uh, the PAU within the facilities, because even though those facilities are above the state average, um, other facilities do still have PAU. And is there the opportunity to create financial incentives uh, to get that type of volume out of the hospital uh, and provide other avenues of care for the patients that are currently using it? Uh, last one on uh, value-based care is to consider enhancements to Vermont's all-payer ACO model when negotiations with CMS uh, begin. We threw out a couple of ideas, uh, but certainly there are others. Uh, considering global budgets for hospitals or increased uh, payer and provider participation. Uh, I know there were some comments earlier about how you know the ACO model fits into this larger discussion, uh, and we absolutely agree that uh, it can be a tool to create increased alignment in a value-based care payment system. Uh, there are additional tools that could be explored that continue to align financial incentives, not only for hospitals, uh, but for other providers that can support the goals of the model. Uh, the one benefit of global budgets is they do change the financial incentives from the emphasis on volume under fee for service and offer predictable revenue streams, particularly for rural hospitals. Uh, and so uh, thinking differently about the way rural hospitals in particular are paid uh, and how that may overall help to control uh, the total cost of care over time. Uh, and how does that align with some of the goals of Vermont's all-payer ACO model, particularly as you uh, think about future discussions with CMS about the future of it? Uh, I'm going to turn it over to Patrick now to just share a little bit of thought around uh, regulatory enhancements, particularly around uh, expanding data reporting to include additional uh, data points. So Patrick, I'm going to turn it over to you. Sure. Uh, thank you, Patrick. Uh, the uh, in, in terms of thinking about data uh, for regulatory enhancements, um, and this is nothing new to you uh, who've been working in this area, but uh, you can't uh, easily regulate and make informed decisions if you don't know what you're looking at. Uh, so when there's holes in data, incomplete ways of looking at it, uh, it, it makes it very difficult to make uh, informed decisions. And even if you're getting input from your your hospital constituents, for example, on uh, the the types of uh, business that they're doing and the challenges that they're having and so forth, if you don't have a complete picture for the complete system, for example, um, you know if you if you have complete data for you know hospitals on their surgical procedures and so forth, but you don't know what's happening with ambulatory surgery, uh, for example, or you don't know what's happening with uh, with uh, uh, drug prices, for example, within the facilities, you, if you just see it as in terms of aggregate data, it's hard to respond to specific situations and so forth. So I, I think that, uh, you know, it's it's important to say that uh, understanding a comprehensive, uh, getting a comprehensive view of the system uh, in order to uh, understand what's happening with hospitals and particularly where there's opportunities uh, to say uh, where are hospitals complements with the rest of the system and where are they substitutes and when they're substitutes, where should the services be provided most cost effectively? Those are the types of things to be looking at. So uh, uh, so I think this is, uh, we're not making specific suggestions on specific types of data here and so forth, but as a guiding principle, what holes do you face and, and filling those in in a cost effective way that's not too burdensome for the reporting? Okay, Patrick, I'll turn it back. Thanks, Patrick. Yep. Uh, similarly, Beth, uh, look to you for some of the, the quality data reporting requirements. Sure. Uh, similar to some of the ideas that uh, Patrick just presented, thinking about uh, data around the quality measures and how we can better capture that. So we're looking at all payers 
Um, Medicare tends to have the most complete data, so we often are um, left with just looking at Medicare performance, but we really want to look at a broader, um, you know, across all payers and providers. So one of the things to think about is um, can we, in our VCURES data, um, have some of the data fields more complete for Medicaid and some of the commercial uh, commercial payers that are included in that data. It's really important when we're looking at our data to have the consistency and the accuracy because all of the risk adjustment models that are used by payers um, are going to use, uh, typically use that claims-based data. Um, when we're thinking about our data and what's available to build measures and risk models, you know, there's a couple of ways you can get that data. It's either through claims, which really isn't a burden to the hospitals because that, that information is already being provided, or there's abstracted measures, and that's a little bit more of an administrative burden to um, hospitals and providers to have to provide that data in terms of the, the collection and submission. And then there's also survey data similar to um, like the HCAPs that um, that information is uh, provided through a vendor. So just looking at ways that we can um, enhance or um, uh, enrich the data that we have available to us can really help how we're thinking about um, measuring value-based care and how we're looking at risk adjustment. Thanks, Beth. <clears throat> Uh, and the last area of opportunity uh, and under regulatory enhancements uh, is the potential to require hospital performance improvement plans for any hospital that is higher than the average for their peer group on a per cost per admission uh, basis. And these plans would specifically look for areas of opportunity uh, to reduce cost. Uh, and I recognize the concern that was mentioned uh, earlier uh, about uh, you know reducing expenses and is that reasonable in some cases uh, given that the hospitals still have a mission uh, to meet the needs uh, for the services that they're providing for the residents uh, within the local communities. Uh, however, it's at least worth looking as there are some uh, outlier facilities within their peer groups based on uh, the analysis done by Burns and Associates. And so does it still make sense to potentially look into uh, some of these uh, areas Particularly for some of these facilities, the recommendation is to move any services, uh, you know, towards them. For instance, Mount Scutney was one of the uh, facilities highlighted as maybe you could potentially transfer for some inpatient services there. Uh, but is there a corresponding conversation regarding the cost structure uh, to make sure that there is again that balance between uh, uh, appropriate occupancy, uh, quality, and the cost of care uh, being provided? So again, another area for uh, consideration by the group. In summary, uh, we do believe, based on the analysis uh, that we conducted, uh, that Vermont has a unique opportunity to transform the healthcare delivery system, given its focus on hospital sustainability and value-based care. Uh, and again, I do applaud uh, the state of Vermont, uh, the Green Mountain Care Board, and all of you that are working in this space. Uh, I think the approach that you all taking is, uh, is very thoughtful uh, in order to try to uh, think through these uh, issues. And the current value-based programs, such as Vermont's all-payer ACO, can be complementary to hospital right-sizing efforts, balancing that need to reduce costs while still maintaining access to care. Uh, and as uh, you all as policymakers and as the industry continue to consider new care delivery models being utilized around the country, uh, including the new uh, Rural Emergency Hospital uh, grant, uh, program by CMS, um, that you should think of those when making determinations regarding the future services that you know, a lot of the material that we shared again was uh, as a snapshot in time and projecting forward. Uh, but of course, this is going to be uh, an ongoing discussion uh, that can be impacted by policy changes, CMS regulations uh, and others. And so uh, we again appreciate the opportunity to present to you all uh, this afternoon. Uh, so thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, we will stand by for any questions uh, from the commissioners uh, or the public. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Patrick. Uh, we'll start with the board members. Um, questions or comments from board members? I can go ahead and start. Um, I had a one question and then a few comments. Um, I was curious why you chose the, 50, the 70, the 75, and 80 percent capacity benchmarks in terms of were you just trying to balance um, efficiency with ensuring that there was still some ex some capacity for 
exogenous events or things like that. I was just curious about those. Yeah, exactly. Uh, the, the idea uh, uh, in, in picking them, and there was no magic uh, to, to picking those particular numbers, but we uh, uh, we were thinking, uh, you know, you, you don't want to plan for, you, you don't want to plan, you don't want to plan hospitals for the, the, the biggest capacity during the year, but you also want to allow some surge capacity for things like what happened in this last year with COVID, for example, so. Great, thank you. Um, and I don't really have more questions. I will say, um, as I said this morning, we have lots to digest in your presentation, so I really appreciate the, the data and information. Um, I really see today's meetings as the beginning um, of, a, of a conversation and a, the beginning of trying to think about how to move forward. Um, when I was chairing the Rural Health Services Task Force um, and preparing that report for the legislature, I think it it really became clear to me that if if we as a state and here the we is not green mountain care board it's we as the state this is a much bigger issue than the board um, don't think about how to ensure access quality and sustainability of our hospitals um, that you know the market will decide for us and we may or may not end up with as thoughtful a result as if we all come together as a state and think about how uh, these different issues play out because there are trade-offs. Obviously, we could maintain the current amount of capacity and access that we have in our system. That means we are accepting higher costs and we're accepting um, potential affordability issues that we already have to get worse. Now that's just an example, right? So, uh, but that requires a big conversation beyond, I think, the Green Mountain Care Board, uh, because it does have such an impact on all of us in the state. So uh, that's sort of where my head is, hearing all of this and trying to digest it today. Um, I do think, um, in response to some of the comments earlier from this morning, we do need to think about that in a value-based care system because it's clear that that's the direction that the federal government is going in and that we as a state also have committed to. Um, and to me, under in order to do that, you have to understand your baseline and where you're coming from. And I think the both presentations today have aided in that understanding uh, for us and for others. Um, I do think also that when we get the results of the access and wait time investigation, that that will be another input, another good source of information to understand the current environment. Um, and hopefully, uh, although this might be too much to ask, we'll have some sense from that of how much of our current challenges in access are related to pandemic related issues, including the fact that we still have a pandemic, we have high uh, COVID case counts right now. Um, we know that we've had some pent up demand from the pandemic as well as higher acuity. So how much of that is situational and will eventually pass and how much of that is uh, sort of a new normal? That's something that I'm interested in in trying to understand moving forward as well. So um, that wasn't really for the folks at BRG to re react to necessarily, although of course I welcome your thoughts, but I just wanted to share kind of where my thoughts have evolved over the course of the day um, while it was my turn to talk. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank, thank you for your comments. I don't have anything uh, to add or respond to other than I think you highlight the right things, which is uh, this is a multifactorial approach. Uh, and I think the more data that you all have access to will better inform whatever decisions uh, are ultimately made. Okay, Tom. Yeah, I'd like to uh, um, kind of get in the car with uh, with with Robin on on this, this uh, huge amount of information this morning um, and this afternoon. Um, all uh, welcome uh, because uh, every opportunity on deck, I think, is a good place for us to be. Um, but I do think the board needs to work with our our peers to figure out how we move forward from here. When you think about this, this recent period, we've had the strategic workforce um, recommendations from the Agency of Human Services, which uh, they had, uh, I counted them up, 73 shoulds in it. You know, that's a lot of shoulds for uh, folks to do. 
Um, we have recommendations for a state agency task force um, as part of that strategic plan. Um, proposals that we might um, integrate with the state workforce development board. I don't know if that's a good thing to do in terms of, of timing, but it's certainly going to take some effort. We have your work. We have the Burns work. We have the benchmark plan coming up for the QP, QHP plans, and uh, we have the all pair model renewal um, on our plate as well. So how all those things fit together in a coherent effort action plan, not just, you know, uh, a, a, you know, a, a list of possibilities, but how it becomes something that is viable um, is a huge task. Um, and I think, the you know, I know that I, you know, I'm I'm looking forward to helping or or, or being part of or at least um, uh, you know kind of pushing for you know a, a comprehensive integration of of all the things that we've heard. Um, some things may be sustained and engaged, and some things left by the wayside because they just don't work. Um, so that's that's my kind of global thought. Um, my uh, <clears throat> more detailed questions are. One was having to, and Robin kind of got at this a little bit, um, but I was thinking about some of your, um, some of your kind of uh, steady state opportunities. Um, and in Vermont, for example, ski season is uh, an issue for some hospitals in terms of their capacity. Um, and uh, you might not think of this, and I just don't know whether or not 75% is an appropriate margin for Copley, you know, when uh, Copley has a uh, stow in, in its backyard. So it's, 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 you know, those kinds of thoughts, um, uh, you know, that we're going to have to kind of dig deeper, you know, with the information, uh, with the kind of across the board information that you've presented, you know, by hospital to make sure that it makes practical sense. Um, I'm also wondering if there are any, um, Kind of waivers or um, experiments or tests in progress for what you call reimagining acute care, the hospitals without walls, hospitals at home, the, the uh, many micro hospitals. Are those just ideas at this point, or are you aware where those are you know actively being pursued on the ground? Sure, uh, I'll touch on the first one, which is uh, seasonality. So on the seasonality one. Um, we did specifically look at that and we did not see, you know, huge swings uh, in the occupancy rates based on the different months of the year by a uh, hospital. And uh, we'd be more than happy to, uh, to share that information again. Um, but we, that is one thing that we specifically were uh, concerned about for the, exactly the reason uh, that you mentioned. So we didn't see big swings in it, but again, we're more than happy uh, to, to reshare that information to make sure that it's a uh, top of mind. Uh, and on your second one about the, the different models, uh, so the example of that freestanding medical facility, for instance, that is something that uh, is currently, there are multiple ones of those in, uh, in Maryland that have, uh, you know, kind of pivoted to a different care model. Uh, hospital at home, there are organizations uh, around the country uh, that are in the process uh, of launching them. Uh, the freestanding medical or uh, the freestanding emergency departments to Patrick's earlier point uh, do exist and some micro hospitals uh, do as well. Um, so these aren't, you know, completely, uh, I think I get your point that they're, they're not completely theoretical uh, exercises, but there are real uh, tangible examples where you can see what they look like uh, and assess the pros and cons of whether or not that model would ultimately make sense uh, for what you ultimately decide to do uh, with some of the uh, hospitals within Vermont. Um, thank you for that. That's helpful. Um, one more question has to do with the cost shift. Um, in Vermont, uh, the cost shift is, and I think for most states, the cost shift is a huge problem. And I kind of struggle with the concept of moving toward value-based payments, which I wholeheartedly support, but keeping in mind that those payments also have to cover for the cost shift. And, um, and so when you have Medicare being a minor cost shifter and Medicaid being a major cost shifter and both of those being programs sponsored by CMS and CMS is pushing us uh, and helping us uh, transition to value based payments. It, it seems a little bit circuitous um, and I'm just wondering if, if you're aware of any efforts in other states where 
states are trying to um, push CMS to be more of a partner in terms of mitigating the cost shift. I, yes, so I will say so on the on your uh, your you raise a good point in that um, you know one of the challenges, particularly with Medicaid reimbursement rates uh, being so low, is not only does it not cover the cost uh, for the hospitals, uh, but does potentially present access issues with certain providers, particularly out in the community, just not willing to take uh, Medicaid. And so that's a that's an ongoing challenge. I would say you know when it comes to Medicaid rates, you know the state does have the ability to a certain extent uh, to set those Medicaid rates, recognizing that it is uh, an additional state expense. Uh, but could there be opportunity uh, there? I will say uh, there are examples. So when when Maryland pivoted to uh, its uh, global budget model uh, several years ago, there was a recognition that although uh, we were uh, pivoting to global budgets and so trying to move away from fee for service, uh, there was a certain amount of upfront uh, investment that occurred in order to provide uh, kind of infrastructure dollars uh, to the hospitals in order to prepare themselves uh, for the types of programs that would be needed for these global budgets. Uh, and I will say we are in discussions uh, with another client on a different state right now around an alternative payment model. And it is uh, a heavily uh, public payer uh, hospital uh, that has uh, uh, mostly Medicaid, some Medicare, and then lower uh, commercial type population. So even if they could cost it effectively, it couldn't make up the difference. Uh, and so part of what we're talking about with them around an alternative payment model would involve uh, a request to uh, not only the state, but likely the federal government for some uh, upfront funding uh, with the expectation that over time, by pivoting to more of a global payment model, uh, CMS and the state in the long run will still be better off uh, than the current trajectory uh, that it's on. Thank you, that's all for me. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Jess? Yeah, thank you very much to the whole team at BRG. Uh, as I think everybody has said, this is a lot to consider and a lot to digest. I really appreciate the work. I will say I think this is the most holistic view of our system that we have had today in this in this long day um, since my time on the board. So it's going to you know provide fodder for a lot of important conversations that I hope we have here at the board. I imagine we're going to be continuing this conversation in the future meeting. Uh, there's too much to dig into in the next half hour or so. Um, but I'm also hoping these are conversations that are we're going to have elsewhere uh, in the state. And the, specifically, I'm hoping hospitals, trustees, community leaders, again, see the value in these analysis as right as we're considering ways to improve our system. Uh, building a little bit on Tom's question, I'm wondering if you can speak a little bit more about global budgets. Now that you have more of the Vermont context, uh, you've dug into Vermont data, how might they help us move to a more sustainable hospital system? What can Vermont learn from Maryland? Just, I know that would be a, probably another whole two hour session, but briefly, you know, is, is, you've mentioned global budgets as a, as a tool to get us where we might need to go. So I'm wondering if you can just talk a little bit more about that. I can start with that, and uh, uh, and then Patrick, uh, you Beth, uh, feel free to chime in. But um, sure. uh, the, the global budgets uh, basically, uh, you know, it it flips uh, everything on its head. So that anything that's volume driven, like for in any of the PPS hospitals, basically that uh, are under pressure to uh, uh, to uh, generate a volume in order to keep their margins high and so forth, uh, it turns that on its head. Uh, so essentially, you get a fixed budget, and the idea is, uh, you know. Know, if uh, if you are able to reduce unnecessary utilization, uh, preventable, uh, vo potentially avoidable utilization, you get to keep those dollars or some portion of those dollars. And uh, uh, what it, it it does, however, is it, it, it increases excess capacity in those uh, those hospitals that have avoidable utilization, but it moves the variable cost of those things out of the system uh, pretty immediately. So a Mar a Maryland, for example, has seen um, uh, all but five of its hospitals have had volume drops since 2013, uh, for example, to give you a, a sense of that and Maryland was a high utilization state but uh, so there may be less potential for Vermont uh, uh, in that that regard but it, it shows you how the incentives change uh, uh, substantially now uh, you have critical access hospitals that are already cost reimbursed that may not be uh, that may not be the uh, best model for for those but at least the subset of your hospitals it could be uh, it could be useful um, I, I will say to one of the things that uh, uh, one of the clients that we were, we were working with Patrick was referring to earlier, uh, we've seen uh, state and, and federal initiatives there to uh, uh, in some of the disrupt states uh, that that have done this sort of stuff. They've 
engaged in these initiatives, but then they've seen uh, and, and had temporary funding for it, and then they've seen the avoidable, avoidable utilization come out. And then when the dollars went out with the end of DISRUP, uh, the hospital was financially worse off. It wasn't able to sustain it because it lost the revenue associated with the volume. Global budgets tend to solve that problem and stabilize it. And in fact, uh, Maryland and Pennsylvania, uh, where a colleague of ours is, is now executive director for their demonstration model, uh, both uh, experienced more stable revenue than uh, than the rest of the country did before federal dollars were come in under the COVID pandemic because uh, you had a, a fixed revenue source that was uh, negotiated and, and in place there. So, uh, so I think you know it, it addresses some immediate issues like that for the for the fee for service uh, folks, particularly. I mean, do you see though the the service lines shift? So you know, right now our infrastructure has been built on a fee for service chassis, right? So we're seeing services that are um, designed to generate maximum revenue potentially under a fee for service world, which may not be the case in a, in a global payment value based world. So mm -hmm. I'm wondering, do you see resource? Uh, changes in the hospitals in Maryland, maybe towards more preventative care, more towards care management, more towards you know the the um, the services that we know have high value and will improve population health. Are you seeing that? shift happen within yeah the I'll, I'll i'll touch on that one briefly and hand it over to patrick since he's had a specific hospital experience with this but one thing that uh uh maryland put some upfront dollars in to assist uh, folks with population health efforts and and care coordination efforts and uh and the incentives were built in a way uh to basically say if you get out avoidable utilization you get to keep all the revenue associated with that whereas if you have market uh, changes and market shifts and so forth, uh, you, you keep less of the revenue. So uh, there were specific designs to try to encourage that type of thing. And some of the population health investments, particularly that have been encouraged, uh, have uh, dealt particularly with uh, behavior, behavioral mental health issues, uh, because uh, the high uh, high addiction uh, sorts of things uh, with uh, uh, with uh, uh, you know the uh, opioid epidemic has been one thing that the states had to deal with, as as many others have, but also uh, mental health issues that result in uh, that are highly associated with uh, uh, readmissions to hospitals were one of the things that were being focused on early on. So I do think that there were some specific areas that were emphasized early on uh, with the, the model. But Patrick, you may want to speak to that given your experience with the University of Maryland. Sure. So, um, so to Patrick's point, so uh, I started working uh, for University of Maryland Medical System essentially right when the new global budgets were put in place. Uh, and I can tell you there are both um, clinical and operational changes that occurred over the six years, uh, as well as uh, cultural changes. So, you know, if you had talked to kind of the C-suites at the hospitals in 2014 versus 2020, it was a sea change in kind of how they viewed um, their operational uh, mission uh, and how they viewed kind of what needed to occur. And so if you just give a couple of examples that Patrick specifically mentioned, uh, you know, by focusing on readmissions uh, in particular and making that a real focused measure as part of the model, hospitals that invested in transitional care programs to really better manage uh, the population over that 30-day post-discharge period. Uh, and the state of Maryland went from one of the higher readmission states in the country uh, to uh, better than the national average uh, over the past uh, several years. Hospitals also invested in things like high-risk clinics. So for a high-risk individual that doesn't have a primary care medical home, uh, create a clinic that uh, many times has uh, an internal medicine physician, social worker, pharmacist, uh, and others to really kind of create a wraparound of services for those highest risk uh, individuals uh, to try to make sure that they have a care plan that is sustainable uh, out into the community. Uh, and we've also been fortunate in that uh, Maryland has a kind of its its own unique uh, primary care program called the Maryland Primary Care Program, which is basically a version of comprehensive primary care plus uh, that CMS had previously uh, rolled out. Uh, but unlike some of those previous programs uh, that didn't generate savings, it has actually generated savings. And I think that's in part uh, because of the alignment between the global budgets that have existed for the hospitals, as well as providing incentives to primary care providers to reduce unnecessary utilization, including ED use, and increase uh, the quality. Uh, and so it did require some upfront uh, investment from uh, CMS in order to provide 
more robust primary care infrastructure, uh, but so far has not only been very well received by the primary care community, uh, but has created greater alignment between the global budgets of the hospitals and the provider uh, community uh, and generated savings over the couple of years uh, that it has been up and operating. Oh, just just two notes uh, to, to what you're saying there, Patrick, too. One of the uh, things is uh, the upfront investment is to be recovered uh, through Maryland savings as, as part of the demonstration. So that's that's one of the things uh, that that uh, uh, CMS insisted on, you know, in, in putting those dollars out there, but uh, has, has been quite possible to do. The second thing I would say is uh, there's one type of a fee-for-service reimbursement that has face some challenges uh, under the model, and that's been the academic medical centers actually. So I know Patrick can speak to this too, but uh, the academic medical centers in the state and their teaching programs and making sure that they get uh, the type of volume to grow, especially with clinical innovation, new programs that are coming on that weren't in place at the time the global budgets were put in place. That's been an ongoing discussion. Uh, now, Maryland's a small state, so it can be an ongoing discussion with the uh, commission, but uh, uh, but that, that's that been one of the ongoing challenges. Uh, a, a, a fixed global budget for an academic medical center is uh, a little, um, uh, requires a little more thought than it does maybe for the community hospitals. That's great, fascinating, and I'm anxious to learn more. Um, I think I'll, I have other questions, but you know what, I think I'll just kick it back over to you, Chair Mullen. I know we are short on time. So thank you very, very much. I've really appreciated this presentation, and I think it's gonna be the start of many conversations. Thank you, Jess. At this point, I'm gonna open it up for public comment. Does any member of the public wish to offer public comment at this time? And I'm going to recognize Jeff Tiemann and on deck will be Ham Davis. Great, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me just get my camera ready here. Um, good afternoon, I, I'm Jeff Tiemann, CEO of the Vermont Association of Hospitals and Health Systems. Um, I wanna first thank the consultants at BRG for their hard work on this project, and also thank the Green Mountain Care Board for their focus on our collective sustainability and our shared goal of making sure that we have accessible, available healthcare long into the future. I do wanna make a few comments to help ground us in the current reality, starting with the fact that Vermont's hospitals are very full. Just a snapshot as we speak, um, four hospitals right now report zero medical surgical bed availability. Only three hospitals report ICU availability, representing a total of nine beds available across the state. Nine hospitals report critical staffing shortages. 94 post-acute patients are awaiting placement. 20 people are boarding in emergency rooms for medical surgical need. And another 41 people are boarding for mental health and substance abuse. To put it plainly, we are in a growing capacity crisis. Hospitals are managing day to day. They are in survival mode and meet my mission mode. At any given moment over the past many weeks, any of them or many of them, can be pressing against capacity or actually overwhelmed and providing care in non-medical spaces. Given this reality, we are really far away from a situation where bed consolidation or reduction should be on the table. As a result, this capacity discussion today feels frankly out of touch, out of place and out of time. In fact, I would argue that it is irresponsible and reckless. As was pointed out, we are talking about data from 2019 which does not reflect today's reality. 2019 data does not capture the fact that Albany Medical Center will not take patient transfers, that the same is true in Maine, New Hampshire, Massachusetts, and Connecticut. So Vermont hospitals are making many calls and having patients travel further than ever for the care that they need. Transfers are extremely challenging right now in Vermont itself and around the region and in fact throughout the country. The bottom line is we are not in a 2019 environment and it seems very likely we will ever return to that trend line. Also on the point of data, it seems there's a good possibility that at least some information used in the study is inaccurate or incomplete. I was contacted just today by three hospitals to let me know that the data in the slide deck is not accurate or verified, which then of course would seem to affect the conclusions that have been reached. Also, it appears that very limited, if any qualitative data was involved here, which might've been helpful. The BRG study suggests an overall reduction in beds. And right now, even just the notion of less hospital capacity will frighten our communities, it will harm our missions, and it will have a potentially chilling effect on provider-led health reform. Even more upsetting is that when our very powerful healthcare regulator speaks about excess hospital capacity, 
it sends a terrible and damaging signal to our healthcare heroes. What they could easily hear is that the Green Mountain Care Board is seriously considering highly controversial and unprocessed ideas that could change the units they work in. We need more workers right now, not less. And suggesting that the regulator may move where care is available or try to do that in any way is plainly dangerous when we're doing everything we can to preserve, not drive away our crucial workforce. And on that point, I need to say a word about our healthcare workers. As we sit on this Microsoft Teams meeting, we should move back to reality for a minute and express appreciation for patients and healthcare workers at this precious time. Through great adversity, they continue to show up day in and day out. They take extra shifts, they cover in other departments, and they're providing higher levels of care than they're accustomed to. Thank you as well to Vermonters for your understanding and patience as hospitals and healthcare providers strive under these really trying circumstances to continue delivering the best possible care. So let's honor our healthcare heroes and Vermonters by being very careful how we discuss capacity instead of surfacing immature and risky recommendations. Taking some of the steps named in this report would begin to dismantle the delivery system in the most vulnerable parts of Vermont, precisely the opposite of what we need to be doing right now. I'll just close by saying that I think it is ironic that we are in a hearing about excess hospital beds just hours before another hearing about long wait times for care and mere hours after a state report on hospital operating status that shows our system right now, today, at this moment, is more severely strained and stressed than at any time in the past 20 months, or in fact, at any time ever. So thank you for the opportunity to comment and to BRG for the research. We are also going to follow up with a written letter to address other elements I did not take up in my comments. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. We look forward to seeing those written comments. Uh, you know, I'm not going to get into a debate right now, but uh, this is only a discussion and um, we will move forward from here. Ham Davis and on deck is Dean French. Uh, thank you, Kevin. Uh, I just have a, a, a brief uh, comment um, and then I, I have a I have a specific question. Um, I think that the, these things that were talked about sort of all day today have been um, out in the ether, so to speak, they've been out there. None of the ideas are really brand new. Um, they've ex I've, I've seen them and heard them and sort of worked with them myself since 1980. Okay, and, and, but what was fabulous today was number one, starting to put them together. The second part is, is the fact that they started to put the, the consultants have begun to put numbers. Uh, on these ideas, and yet ideas have floated out there as just ideas, but without much, without much underpinning, and they're starting to get underpinning now with actual numbers. That's not dispositive, okay, but it it changes the atmosphere, I think, completely. The way I look at it, in different to some other commons uh, people that will come, is that to say, there's gonna after today in this area, there's no more place to hide. There's a lot of problems out there with this system, and it's a huge question of whether they can be adequately fixed. It's going to put the Green Mountain Care Board, the Scott administration, the legislature, and the whole health care delivery system under a ton of pressure to start figuring out how we get to get to uh, the reform structure that we need. Anyway, so I think it was great, and I think that you... I don't know what the chances are of moving off of this platform, but I can, uh, in my judgment, they're way better than they were yesterday. So thank you for that. I do have one question for the consultant. The um, the whole question of quality is really kind of a mushy thing in the in in in, in American medicine from one end to the other. I think the, uh, the quality metric that we're using get 33 steps um, in the payer model. Almost all of those steps simply fill in the check, check checking off boxes. Um, the one that is the the one the most the most valuable one that the, the most one that focuses in on stuff that's actually happening on the ground is the idea of readmission to the hospital. Now readmission to the hospital, okay, may mean a lot at Yale New Haven, a Mass General or, or, or Mayo Clinic, okay, 
but it doesn't mean anything much of anything in Vermont. The reason is, if there's a problem, that if somebody gets a bad, bad result, and anybody that thinks there's no bad results is living in a cave, if somebody gets a bad result in Vermont, they're not going back to the place with one surgeon or one doctor, okay? They, they already made the mistake, or whatever it is. Then, then what he's going to do is go somewhere else. So you have available and you collect revision surgery, which doesn't may not mean much at, in Boston, okay, but means almost everything in Vermont. Why and, and, and why does people? Why are you not uh, recommending that you go to revision surgery, which is what Vermont needs, not readmission to the hospital? That's my point. And by the way, Kevin, thank you. I'm done. Thanks, Sam. Any comments on that, Patrick or, or Beth? Beth, would you like to respond to that? So, uh, uh, to be honest, uh, I, it sounds like an interesting idea. It's not something I've thought of before, but uh, because we've usually dealt in the realm of uh, the readmissions definitions from CMS, which uh, also uh, kind of uh, goes uh, readmission to a, a, a different facility with an episode starting, you know, at one spot. So it does pick those up. But uh, but that's an interesting idea I haven't thought of before. So, but Beth, I'll defer to you. You're the expert on quality. Sure. So when we're talking about the readmission measures used by CMS and what we look at is um, adjusted for unplanned readmissions. So um, you are accounting for, you know, that planned next procedure or that type of thing. And when you're thinking about readmissions and you're talking about those bad outcomes, um, are they outcomes caused by that initial hospital or is it access to care issues in that you know post discharge time period so um, it really brings in a whole discussion about population health and primary care access and access to medications or access to follow-up visits so it's you know readmissions i think is a great quality measure because there are so many factors why uh, why patients get readmitted and it can really um, highlight you know, um, highlight those uh, limitations uh, where patients don't have access or resources. Okay, I'm going to call on Dean French next, and on deck is Richard Slusky. Dean? Hey, good afternoon, and I appreciate the report. Um, too many comments to actually share in this group, but I would echo um, Jeff Tiemann, and I would thank uh, Robin for her thoughtful and Tom's thoughtful. Let's make sure we understand the moment and what's the new normal. I, I There are data issues and we'll have to put those in a letter, but um, I would ask the board to come visit me anytime, three or less of you, please. Um, and we can find the 53 beds that purportedly exist at this facility uh, because they don't. Um, we had a 67% occupancy rate in 2019. 47% of our patients in our health service area got their inpatient care in Burlington, which now needs 60 beds according to this report. Wouldn't it be nice if we utilized the capacity in our health service area for inpatient care where we are? North Country, if they were to close their ICU, the next nearest ICU would actually be St. Albans, but we're closing that ICU too. Of course, you have to get over Jay Peak to get to St. Albans, so good luck in the winter. I'm sorry, um, we just have a lot to think about. I do think the Academic Medical Center has a role to improve quality in all of the facilities and work with us to improve quality. I think it's remarkable that two weeks into this report's formation, the Academic Medical Center's CMS star rating was three and it became five as we rolled into the report. It's the first time I've seen with lagging and rolling data that CMS uses anybody move from three to five stars. I'd like to understand that better, but it it's immaterial. I think the bottom line is we all need to aspire to be five star facilities in the state and that should be a focus. Um, looking at ASCs and micro hospitals as escape ramps for lowering cost. As the chief operating officer and chief medical officer of the Baptist Health System in San Antonio, 
stood up seven standalone emergency rooms and three micro hospitals. Uh, we were a for-profit hospital chain. Those were wonderful opportunities to generate additional revenue and they worked well. I'm not sure, in, and in that urban center of two million people, we were able to position them all within the stone's throw of a traditional PPS hospital, and it worked. Um, we, we did couch it in terms of access to care. I'll stop there. I might be being a little, um, I don't think it's the solution for Vermont is what I'm really trying to tell you. Do we need, if we were to decrease orthopedic surgeries in places, uh, we're, we're decreasing our ability to maintain surgical staffing. I do think the people in Northwest Vermont need to be able to get their appendectomy care for their emergency C-section done. And that requires certain core staffing to exist 24 seven. And so those ambulatory cases help provide the stability we need in that setting. Those are realities of rural medicine. This isn't Maryland. Sorry, guys, but it's not. The last time I, you know, I've been to Maryland a few times. It doesn't feel quite the same landscape as Vermont. Um, so just a lot to digest here. I would ask the board's uh, thoughtful interactions as we go forward and try to understand what the healthcare model should be. There are clearly opportunities for us to improve what we're doing, and I welcome those improvements. Thanks. And we look forward to working with you, Dean. Richard. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Kevin. And I, I'm not surprised at the discussion that's occurring right now. As a former hospital CEO in Vermont for 28 years, I mean, I've been on both sides. I've been on the regulatory side through the Green Man Care Board and also on the hospital side. Um, I, I applaud BRG and the work that you've done putting these recommendations on the table. I mean, it takes a lot of guts to do that. And I think, um, you know, the expectation is that there'll be challenges to the data, to the information, to the recommendations themselves. But what I have said repeatedly, if we're going to be successful in implementing the all-payer model, we need to get everyone together around the table and sit down and have this discussion. And I think what you've done here today is put fodder on the table for discussion. And, and I think that's an important step uh, towards what we're trying to achieve. So I would just recommend that the board take this seriously. Uh, I think it, it requires the involvement of the governor, the secretary of administration, the ACO, the payers, the hospitals, et cetera. And uh, I mean, things can't stay the same and they need to change. And I think how it gets changed is best achieved through consensus and through discussion, and Vermont's small enough to do that. Um, the Maryland experiment, I mean, as many of you know, I've been an advocate for global budgets for years, and I think they will work. I do think they change the culture in the hospitals. They, they change all the incentives, and they allow the hospitals to do what they really should be doing, which is taking care of their population. So how you get paid matters. Uh, I think it can make a difference. And I think critical access hospitals, by the way, I was a CEO of one. I think critical access hospitals can also benefit from a global budget because uh, half of our revenue is still fee for service. And uh, so I, I think um, they, they ought to be in, thought about in that concept. So I would, I would just encourage the board to take this seriously, to move forward. And I hope the hospitals and the hospital association can get behind the conversation. I know there's it's going to be a difficult one, but I hope you can get behind it and call out what doesn't work and where opportunities may exist. And that's how we're going to move forward. So thank you, Jessica, thank you for suggesting that I come here today. I was it was very informative and almost encouraging. So <laughs> I hope you go forward. Thank you, Richard. And as we know that uh, maybe some of these suggestions uh, aren't appropriate for Vermont, but we also know that the status quo isn't working either and that we need to work together. And Richard, I share your passion for global budgets. It's something I've believed in for over a decade now is the uh, direction that uh, 
um, we should be moving in and that puts the pressure on the people at the local level to figure it out how to do things better and um, as long as there's ways to um, make sure that quality and access are there I, I think it's something that uh, um, makes a, a, a really a lot of sense is there other public comment Hearing none, is there any new business to come before, any old business to come before the Greenmont Care Board? Hearing none, is there any new business to come before the Green Mountain Care Board? Hearing none, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. second. It's been moved and seconded to adjourn. All those in favor? Please signify by saying aye. 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 Any aye. opposed signify by saying nay. Remember 530, the um, public hearing on uh, the patient and provider experience uh, when it comes to access and wait time. So um, hopefully uh, many people will be able to join us then. And I want to thank um, Patrick, Patrick and Beth for um, a stimulating discussion. As you can see, um, whenever you bring up radical ideas, um, uh, there is always a, a reaction, but that's a good thing because it gets people thinking of what could work. So I think that uh, um, it, it wasn't that the Green Mountain Care Board was being tone deaf. We, we understand what's happening in the hospitals. We thank our hospitals for everything that they've done. We especially thank the frontline workers as they're dealing with something that um, no one had ever envisioned they would have to deal with. And yet we are here. And so um, we, we can't um, just decide that we're not going to try to come up with a vision for our future healthcare system. And, and we need to uh, keep moving forward with the discussion and this is really at a, a very early stage. I don't think anybody's out championing um, uh, particular changes today, but everybody is championing the ability to have the conversation to see what works in the small state of Vermont so that everybody is better served. So thank you everyone and have a great, great day. Great.